So if I could ask someone who to read, why are guardrails written as prohibitions? Would somebody read that for us? Please? I'll read it. This is one of the first questions that uh, commonly comes up, so it's perfectly natural to wonder. At the core, guardrails are written the way they are to, one, allow the board to protect the values of the community, while, two, allowing maximum freedom for educators to serve the unique needs of students. It's not obvious at first look, but writing guardrails as prohibitions on superintendent authority what the superintendent may not do, accomplishes these two objectives while writing them as directives. Mm -hmm. What the superintendent should do actually violates both. Here are a few different ways to, uh, to think about this that usually help people who are first learning about the power of guardrails. So I also included a hyperlink for you to be able to look at what this paragraph is about. There was a video produced by Columbus City Public Schools where AJ was speaking to the board and then they drew a cartoonish, um, about a less than two minute video, I believe. And it's in essence the same analogy that's here. It's the same one that we use in the two-day training of when when the board order when you as a board member order an Uber or a Lyft, um, you're, the first thing you're typically doing is giving it direction on where you want to go. And we define that in the goals and guardrails as the goal. You're saying my goal is to get to Phoenix International Airport. And so when the vehicle pulls up, what part of the vehicle? I ask you what part of the vehicle do you typically get in? And most of you sit in the back sometimes maybe in the passenger seat, but never in the driver's seat because the driver in the analogy here is the superintendent. You as the board are putting the, the, the goalpost as to where you want your superintendent to take you. That is your educational expert. And so by one, you're already giving your superintendent very clear direction, which you've designed some drafted goals. Kudos to you. So you've now in essence put the direction that you want the superintendent to take you in. Then comes the other part of this, the pathway to the whole child. Of uh, We want to talk about SEO. We want to talk about safety and security. We want to talk about all of these other outcomes because you have now demonstrated that you're prioritizing student outcomes, which have historically been put on the back burner by a lot of educational folks in the country. So now that you've done that, now you want the guardrails. You want these parameters. And you want to be very, very clear as to what you don't want to see anymore. And so here's how it works in analogy. Let's say we're going from here. Let's say that I'm your, I'm your guest and I'm heading back to the airport tomorrow. Uh, what are at least two different ways for me to get to the airport from here? Go down 44. Go down 44. What's another one? I'll get on the freeway, the 10. The 10. So 44 and 10, right? So what? Let's let's say that tomorrow you know that around the time that I'm heading to the airport, there's going to be a parade of some sort that it's usually not going to be in the app. Uh, or something like that's going to pop up. But you know that if I go down 44, I'm going to get caught up in traffic and I'm likely to miss my plane. Wouldn't it be wise of you to tell me, hey, don't take 44 tomorrow. Don't take 44 because you're going to you're going to be late or you're likely to miss your plane. Now, whichever other routes I choose to take, you're not telling me I got to take 10, but you're telling me that there's this one route. There's probably about 10 other routes I could take to the airport. You're just telling me, hey, don't take 44. We're from here. We know what's going on. If you really want to get back home, don't take that road. It is a very clear direction. And also it's freeing because then now, okay, I won't take 44, but I've got all these other paths that I can take to get to the airport because my goal is to get to the airport and then to get home. So with guardrails in the way that they're written, it's to do that. It's to give uh, a clear uh, understanding to your superintendent and not have him wondering, what does the board really mean? If it's something related around security, don't want your superintendent wondering what, you, what you're what you meaning by security. You wanna be very, very clear about what it is that you don't wanna see happen here. Mm -hmm. And so then the freedom you give him is he gets to come back with three measurables in smart format. This is why they gotta be framed this way because then he's gonna to prove to you over the course of time, he's gonna get take care of take care of this issue. I've been calling them pain points for boards and communities because you as board members have been hearing and constantly hear from people in your community, at the grocery store, at the gas station, different places that you're at. There are people who are telling you what some of the pain points are. And so tonight we're gonna explore those and then we'll have some clarity for you to give your superintendent. The fun part for him and his team is he's gonna come back and say, these are one to three ways that I believe I can begin to take care of this and there won't be confusion and that's the main thing we don't want we don't want superintendents 
to, to, to not be clear. And then two, not that that would happen here, but we don't want a superintendent to wiggle their way out and say, well, I thought that's what you meant. No, we were very clear on what we meant. And that's what this allows us to do. Yes. I apologize if you already mentioned this. I noticed most of the samples have four or five. Is there a magic number like the goals that you think is good? Great question. Okay. Well, one to five is what's recommended. Uh, same way now, um, you know, five at the most for sure, but it's whatever you decide as a board tonight. I also had a quick question. Some of the examples talked about constraints versus guardrails, which I think it said like in one place, Texas, they're called constraints, but it talked about board, like some had board guardrails and some had superintendent yes. constraints or guardrails. And I didn't know if that's also interchangeable or different. No, they're they're different. different. And okay. so for for, for for the you again, we're we're on the we're on the same page. We will I will ask us to entertain board self guardrails first tonight, so that before we can place guardrails on a superintendent, let's place them on ourselves, the board first. Uh, I think you model great leadership when you do that. Now the difference will be on those that you will not be measuring your self guardrails. Those are gonna be what we normally call board norms. What are behaviors that you don't want to see in your boardroom? You're not only thinking about now, you're thinking about the past, but you're also thinking about what do you not want to see in the future? So if there's been a if there have been bad behaviors or there have been things that you've noticed, uh, maybe not only here but elsewhere, and you have a concern that that might pop up here in Creighton, I would I would say that this is a time for you to be able to say that to, to to bring that forth. And you're right, in Texas they're called constraints. Everywhere else they're called guardrails. Off topic, but did you say that there was like a statute that they've adopted in the state of Texas that implements this? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. And in Texas, we have X amount of hours we're required to do, and yeah, there, yeah. And this framework is not required, although it is strongly recommended for districts that are that are struggling academically and or have a lot of board chaos. I can't decide if I'm surprised by this or not. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Okay. Do we have any other questions or comments? Because if not, then I think that's a great idea is for us to start with our board guardrails. Um, I believe in true leadership and that's focusing on the I first versus going. And so once we get ours get together, I think we can take some time, talk about what we really don't want to see and the board. I think we've been at the spot where we're working very cohesively, so that shouldn't be too hard. So thank you so much, Dr. Ramos. We're going to go ahead and get started and brainstorm. And if we have any questions, we'll go ahead and yes. Sounds good. The only thing I'm going to say is I will ask Superintendent Jay Mann to not participate because he's not a board member and we want to protect him. Right. And we want him to have his role. So I'm going to encourage the three of you to, you know, partners, however you decide to do that. But absolutely try to come up with each one of you come with one or two that maybe come to mind. And then let's see, let's see what we agree with. And then when we're done with that, we'll move to superintendent. Okay. Super awesome. Thank you. And Dr. Ramos, if I could, we, um, we had that feedback we sent out digitally to the board that came from the community council meeting. One of the things we asked them for, even though we weren't able to fully train them on guardrails, were maybe some community values that might be considered for the guardrails. So they're integrated together, the feedback on the goals and the guardrails. But if anyone would like a hard copy, yeah. um, we do have some hard copies with us. Yes, please. I would love one. How much for doing it? This one, just be careful, the staples mess. Yeah, they're, um, I think our stapler, you might want to give a guardrail around having better office equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this is not That's successful. Dangerous office. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can we count? That's, yeah, that's it. So I'm going to give you about 15 minutes, and then we'll, I'll check back in. If you need more time, we'll do that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Just to clarify, though, a lot of... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. A lot of this feedback, though, will go back more on the superintendent yes. guardrails. But yes. if we're looking at some of those extra commentary is where we might be able to pull. Okay. Yes. Unless you hear something specifically related to the board. Yeah. Thank Got you it. for that, Lindsay. Thank you. You two will work together, and I'm going to move okay. over here. I guess. <laughs> oh, so I don't know. I thought it went well. I did early, like, between, do, they had just finished this section about the process. 
for him, so I love right before they did the guardrails. Okay. So I was there for most of it. Okay. I thought one, um, it was kind of lower attended compared to other viewing houses we've had, but I think it's because it was cold and raining. Okay. And it was funny because Reese was like, wow, there's a lot of people here. I was like, no, there's not. Um, so it was kind of funny because I think he's used to us struggling for you know, when we work this year. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't want to be that more people come to this usually. But the people that did attend, I think, were just quite um, And try to take, you know, yeah, seriously, and also, but I think um, it's when you one of the admin and us were the admin were at different tables, and then we were floating around mm -hmm. three of us because you were there. So I thought we did well trying to help guide things too. We're making sure people were understanding what the heck we were talking about. Um, I'm curious to see what these guardrails things say. Higher quality other sugar processes, which I've literally seen sugar processes. Two extras, all the little. It's kind of mixed up if you'll notice. You have to like switch pages to get to the guardrails. Family connections, relationships.
back. All right, we're going to go ahead and circle back. It looks like we have a few goals. I'm excited to hear what my colleagues have to say over here since we came up with some too. All right, do you guys want to go ahead and share some that you have and maybe they match what we were saying over here? Sure, so we looked through all the examples and um, with the exception of the Houston guardrail or constraints, um, we kind of felt like the other districts had a lot of guardrails that were individualized to whatever specific board member problems they were having at the time that they adopted these. And we felt like we really liked all five of the Houston constraints and we think that they're appropriate for our board. I don't really, we didn't really like the other ones and some of them are very similar to the Houston ones. And, and then there's a few from the others that we feel are also like a lawsuit waiting to happen. So, um, <laughs> yes. so anyway, or I feel that way. Um, but that being said, I, we didn't think of any new ones because as we went through the Houston ones, I felt we like they kind of just touched on everything that we feel is important to begin with. So, yeah, we kind of didn't have any new ones either, but I think the one that we should set first as a priority and make sure that and I think we all can agree on is not spending more that we at least have to spend 50% of our board time talking about, or can you rephrase that? I, I, sorry, I don't have it in front of me. The board will spend no less than 50% of its meeting time monitoring progress on student outcome goals. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty good one to have. We're adopting this framework for a reason and that should be one of the board goals. So the board always has that expectation to do even when we're not here. And then we kind of, there were some that we, and the other areas that kind of align with some of our initial ideas because we started brainstorming ideas and we didn't like the wording of them. So then we went and read all the others. Um, so one of the ones, I don't remember which school, but um, the engaging, not engaging in negative conversation or public behaviors that put district staff, students, board um, as a whole in a negative manner or light. Um, and just go to go back to your point, I know that a lot of these probably are because of certain situations that are going on, but um, some of these I did like because just because we're not behaving in those manners doesn't mean that whoever will be here elected 5, 10, 15 years from now won't try to do whatever it is. So once we adopt these type of goals and set an expectation of how we should conduct ourselves as board members, I think it's going to be really hard for them to come and try to undo what, what's already being done. And at least it sets them with an expectation of this is what you cannot do. So even though I'm so thankful that that's not a situation we're in, I think we do need to send or set out the framework or lay it down for them for whoever ends up being in these seats in the future. My concern with that guardrail is um, one, uh, the wide opportunity, the opportunity for a wide um, interpretation of negative conversation or negative public behaviors, depending on who's in the majority and who's in power. Um, that could turn around to bite people in the butt if they aren't careful. And then also I think that that one was borderline for me. The other one, the publicly criticize any decisions made by the corporate by the body corporate or administration. So one and three under West Laco. I, I think number three for sure is like a first amendment lawsuit waiting to happen. I didn't like number but three. But number one, yeah. I think you're tiptoeing. Well, and we were like, we rope. were playing on the wording, <laughs> but we, and we only pulled that out because we were talking about and doubling down on what Sophia said, like we were thinking too, like in the future for anybody coming on, these are the expectations for this board you're joining. So we were thinking about some other districts and things we've seen and like just that idea of, you know, if you have concerns or you're really upset, you know, calling the superintendent and having those conversations um, rather than, you know, coming up and using the public's time in a and tirade. And the way that so I... So we word that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just looking for a way to word it in a way that still allows for dissent and not yeah. punishing dissent. Oh, yeah, definitely. If, the majority is not who we think the majority is going to be right now. And the only way that I saw this too is that um, it's very disrespectful to come up to board meetings and use the public's time.
bashing on things that you don't like. I, to me, it's if we're board members, if we have issues, that's what executive sessions are for. And that back and forth, you know, talk or whatever you don't like, if you're angry, that's where it happens. And we, we figure that stuff out. But to come up and the reason that I was kind of making reason of this board um, guardrail is that you come on public time. And yes, we can criticize. We were elected officials and we have our own opinions. But we're not going to use our public's time and our community's times to attack one another or to talk the, uh, attack the superintendent or the teachers. That's, to me, disrespectful to our community. We should be talking about other stuff. So if we set kind of this little framework, and maybe you're right, we can change the wording, but that's my reasoning behind it, to set that precedent that that kind of stuff can happen another time, just not while you're on public time in a public board meeting. That's not the place for it comes to how we represent like we should be role models and having professional and respectful discourse you know even if we disagree and sometimes you see boards where it's not that and and I think individuals don't realize that you know people from other districts teachers looking to work there watch those meetings and so it's we we're trying to get to a way I don't we don't know what the wording is but something where you know we do represent the district and we we are a model to our staff and to our students on if you disagree, how do you do it respectfully and when and where and how are the appropriate times to have certain conversations. So whatever that wording looks like, it was that gist of things. I think you're you're just asking for trouble with something like that because if, if you have a dissenter who wants to come in, um, it's not enforceable, you know? And I'd rather focus on more positive things that I think we're all in alignment on the Houston stuff, you know. Um, I don't know if you guys want to read, if somebody wants to read those. What other ones did we have on there? Um, we had um, not performing or appearing to perform responsibilities delegated to the superintendent. And then the other one we had was a spinoff of one of the Houston ones, the constraint one. Which one? So the not conducting duties without including all your stakeholders. So we did, but that was from Houston. Sure. So the one that wasn't was um, not performing or appearing to perform any responsibilities delegated to the superintendent. I like the stakeholder ones, but I just would like to make sure that we're stakeholders, that students get included in stakeholders. I don't know if we need to be a little bit more aggressive with that word just because a lot of the times that's the most important student group that we're doing this for and that's the last group we ever hear from. If you look at the constraint number one, that's the first, they don't say stakeholders, yeah. they list them out in students. I was just the first oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. I didn't read it verbatim. Yeah, and then if the number one, if we like the wording, we can adopt that one too as a goal. Um, do you mind reading it out, Lindsay, since you have it in front of you, please? Uh, uh, the board will not conduct its duties without including students, families, teachers, and community members, parentheses, inclusive of those that speak languages other than English, in a manner that inspires broad community ownership of board policy. Does anyone know what an LBB review was on the constraint number three? Okay. I don't. I think that one that you just read, Lindsay, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, that's yeah. We were like, this is that's why we're here. So yeah, the only one we didn't, or the only other one that wasn't in the Houston that we liked was the uh, Venus constraint two. Oh, okay, that's the superintendent one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was really just the wording of that we felt was broad enough, but kind of got it the going back to the role of the board versus superintendent and, you know, avoiding micromanaging operations versus like following the process of inputs and outputs and guidance and guardrails. Correct. And it kind of speaks to the framework. Yeah. And now the fun part to try to narrow these down to no more than five. Yeah. I, I think now that I've heard the ones that are additional, I will make my arguments for um, especially constraints three, two, three, and four in Houston. I think those are super important to what we're doing here. And if we're talking about building um, 
systems and structures that can persist beyond the people who create them um, in pushing back and trying to change the other systems and structures that exist. I, I just don't see where we can get there without these people if we don't have these things out in our guardrails. Otherwise, it's going to get lost in the mix. And I'm specifically talking about discipline, disproportionate, disproportionate discipline, equity audits and SPED reviews, and then annual review of strengths and weaknesses plan for team building board professional development that includes anti-racist training. I think that if you don't have guardrails that address some of these things specifically, you could still be focusing but missing the mark completely and still be trying to focus, but you could just be like swimming with no direction. Um, especially if you don't prioritize these things in your personal life already. Um, could we include in that guardrail policy as well? Because it's it's not some, our, our policy services or our policies that we have don't really get ever looked into. And maybe if we can have a refresher of policy services every five years, too, would be good. So, what are you talking about? Um, I'm talking about constraint number uh, three. three. Okay. And instead of having the LBB, because I'm not sure what that is, and, and putting in there some policy services as well. And I'm good with that one. I think you could potentially leave out constraint two if you adopt something like constraint four. Because I feel like that just leads to constraint two. If you're actually That's what I was trying to look at. Things. Could we change the wording to include that? But <coughs> an LBB, if it's helpful, is the Legislative Budget Board in Texas. Oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. Performs okay. reviews of, they perform management and performance reviews of school districts in Texas. Mm, okay. So. So it probably would be challenging oh, nice. for us to get them to. I wish come we do had that. that. <laughs> <laughs> we have the Free auditor services. general instead, and provides us with useless information. Jay, the microphone's on. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to participate. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Providing information. That was hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so for sure we're going to do constraint number five too, but constraint number five off of the Houston should be our number one, correct? Yeah, that's what we had put as a number one. I think that's what you read, right, Lindsay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not like married to the language on constraint four, but like I said, I think if we do something similar to constraint four, it will lead to constraint two being accomplished. Yeah, you're right. So I think we can... Is there something that we can add on number four to make sure two is more? Mm. No, I think if we just leave that anti-racist training, that includes discipline and all those. That's so we can take away number two. Yeah. Take this one away. Yeah, take two number. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Ramos, that's is oh, don't kind of talking about doing a self-evaluation, right? which we haven't done, I don't think, since you guys have been on the board. We did one, we did one in 2020, yeah. and I think after that we didn't do it. The night that you adopt the the goals and guardrails, after you adopt, we're going to do our first student outcomes focus self-evaluation. Oh, okay. I and just, then we can get we, an example. We determined at the two day that you would get zero because you didn't have board goals per se. Um, and you hadn't revisited your vision, but now you have. You've decided to stick with your vision, right? It's right up here. Yes. Um, so I didn't want to set you up for something that, you know, we're, we're working fast. So you will do your first self-eval when you, the same night that you adopt your goals and your guardrails. Remind me on your y'all's additional list down there, what's number two without including? Which one is that? Two one? was... Oh, including uh, community Oh, that's the stakeholders, stakeholders one. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think we're both, we're all on board with that one. That's already on there. Or no, it's not. No, it needs to no, be added on board with that one. Where did y'all get that one from? It, it's the one Houston one? constraint number one. Number one. And out of the two left on that list, I feel like I'm most comfortable with number three. Or the second one. Yeah. Well, and I feel like it, it just goes back to supporting the framework and the like that interpersonal 
Where does everybody fit? What are the roles and responsibilities? Constraint number two, yeah. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I feel comfortable. The board will spend no less than 50, oh, it's okay. I just want to read these through. The board will spend no less than 50% of its meeting time monitoring progress on student outcome goals starting at zero today and will be 50% by the end of the second quarter of 2024. The board will not allow five years to pass without an equity audit, a policy review, and SPED review. The board will not operate without an annual review of strengths and weaknesses and a plan for team building and board professional development that includes anti-racist training. I love that because I don't think we've ever had any type of anti-racist training um, as boards. So, cool. The board will not conduct its duties without including students, families, teachers, and community members, inclusive, inclusive of those that speak languages other than English in a manner that inspires broad community ownership of board policy. And board will not perform or appear to perform any of these responsibilities delegated to the superintendent. I love them. Feedback? Comments? Yes. or is it just implied because these are the board guardrails? It's, it's implied that it's the board's strengths and weaknesses because it's our board goals. Do we want to add the words um, self-assessment um, or whatever it is? Uh, self-evaluation, just so it's super of, clear? The board will not operate without an annual self-board self review. Self or self-evaluation. Self-evaluation. Self instead of the word review, maybe. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. And can there be a comma after weaknesses because I am a grammar? I know. I oh. <laughs> I was going to say on number two, the word policy doesn't capitalize, and I'm an Oxford comma, but that's up to everybody else. <laughs> that's <what I> mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love it. Take the grammar teacher out of the classroom, but you can't take the grammar. These are in drafts, so I'm going to give them right back to you all, and then you can, anything comes up. And especially also because just like with the goals is you're vetting them from your community. If something changes, you're at least taking some type of a draft to them. Yeah. Any other comments or discussion on these five goals? Um, Board self guard rails. Yep. Guard rails. Someone read them. I mean, so, I'm Someone sorry. Read them one more time. I just, can't, I cannot read it from here. I don't know. I don't know why, but yeah, I can go ahead. So the board will spend no less than 50% no, of its meeting time monitoring progress on student outcome goals starting at zero today and will be 50% by the end of the second quarter of 2024. The board will not allow five years to pass without an equity audit, a policy review, and a SPED review. The board will not operate without an annual self-evaluation of strengths and weaknesses and a plan for team building and board professional development that includes anti-racist training. The board will not conduct its duties without including students, families, teachers, and community members, inclusive of those that speak languages other than English in a manner that inspires broad community ownership of board policy. Board will not perform or appear to perform any of the responsibilities delegated to the superintendent. Thank you, looks good. I believe our board guardrails are drafted and ready to go. Can the words uh, be added before board? I'm, I'm sorry, what? The, the board, oh yeah, yeah. The yeah, 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 the, the board. board, there we go, thank you. <laughs> good catch, Hilda. All right, you ready to move on? Well, again, you're modeling. It's uh, parallel processing again. You as a board are modeling what you now can shift your attention over to superintendent, uh, drafting superintendent guardrails. And Superintendent J. Mann, you will be able to participate in this arena. As you'll see in your SOFG manual, it'll say that you drafted superintendent guardrails in collaboration with your superintendent. So. What comes up for you here, um, I will ask uh, Superintendent Mann to, to partner with one of you as you have a conversation. Uh, you have examples, but again, I want you to really uh, be mindful of what your community has been bringing to you uh, pretty often. You've hopefully picked up some themes and some patterns. 
this is that moment, that opportunity to focus on other outcomes. But again, it's the pathway to the whole child and it's in support of achieving your student outcomes. So just a quick example, if facilities was something that was of grave concern to, it's a message that you continually hear about from community members and you know that there's students who are in classrooms that are uncomfortable, teachers that are uncomfortable, then that's usually how those things come about. Try your best to connect it to how this is gonna best support the achievement of your student outcome goals. I'll give you about 10, 15 minutes and I'll check back in and see if you need more time. Enjoy. <laughs> You guys gonna do we're gonna do partners now since there's oh partners line. and partners yeah.
Thank you. All right. It looks like we've had our discussions with um, the superintendent guardrails. And if you guys want to go ahead and get us started on some that you guys came up with, and then we can go from there. Sure. There were a couple that we really liked as is that um, were also themes that came out of a lot of the feedback um, from the community council. So one of those was um, the Tulsa guardrail one, the superintendent will not allow the ineffective implementation of social emotional learning strategies that support effective teaching and learning in a safe, inclusive climate and culture. And SEL came up in a ton of the feedback. Um, another one that um, we also liked as is that again was a major theme was the Houston constraint to the superintendent will not allow the district to operate without students having effective school based wraparound support systems. We uh, liked the Houston constraint one um, with some additions and edits. So it currently says the superintendent will not allow the district to operate without a system to recruit slash employ strong teachers. We would say recruit, employ, and provide ongoing professional development for teachers who meet the needs of, and it says needing the most support, we said meet the needs of all students. And then, oops, I gotta go back. Uh, Tulsa number two, where it says the superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable for students. We liked that, but also thought about maybe that would be a good area to explicitly tie in some pieces from some of the other ones where it directly referred to special education students and underserved students. Um, and then, there wasn't really one in here, but we did talk about how like one of our guardrails is about ensuring all the stakeholder input. So if there'd be something similar from the superintendent's side. Awesome, thank you. Um, Ms. Gibson McLean and Superintendent Mann. Yeah, so um, to cut to the chase, we didn't like any of the Houston or Columbus ones. We thought they were redundant and could be covered by some of the other ones we liked. We also like Tulsa number one, we really like Tulsa number two, and we really like Midland number two. Um, and then as far as uh, two others that we liked but weren't like completely married to are Tulsa four and five. We think we could rewrite Tulsa number four in a way that accomplishes what it's trying to get across without um, being as reactive. I guess is what I should say. I, I get, what we're trying to get across is let's not wait till we're at the point of, let's be a little more proactive with the guardrail rather than focusing on the um, corrective action portion. So instead of setting the bar low for like, don't get in trouble with the state, it would be nice <laughs> if it was, so how some of the other ones are more active where it says the superintendent shall, and you know, it would be related to ensure, you know, an active team appropriate, active sir. Role in ensuring <laughs> appropriate services yep. are being implemented or something like yeah so and then for number five i know that's high school specific but i think that we could rewrite it in a way that addresses middle school specific life skills that our students should have by the time they go to ninth grade okay so from one of the ones that i think we all kind of agree one is i think that the same goal that the board has regarding stakeholders and community students i think that should be a superintendent one too that the superintendent will not make any major decisions without making sure you know we've had some kind of feedback first without so i think that one should be at least one and you can do exactly like copy and paste the board one but just make it a superintendent guardrail um and then i'm gonna defer real quick to miss mcsheffrey because i think off of what miss gibson mcling was saying you had some comments yeah so i think we're on the same page but um um guardrail number four in tulsa i felt like tulsa's guardrails were not really hard to measure maybe they're too vague but this this one this number four is not vague actually but 
The superintendent will not allow the district to be in state corrective action regarding services to students with disability, including proper and timely identification. That is a really low bar, as you said, Mr. Mann. There's another one that we found that was more specific. Um, and Sophia, oh, here we go. The superintendent, this is from Houston. The superintendent will not allow the district to operate without students receiving special education services meeting IEP progress. Um, you know, that seems like kind of a low bar also, yeah. but that is a problem if you've ever had a kid with I, an IEP. Um, uh, so I don't know, maybe it's a higher bar. I mean, I think we're on the same page as far as a, a special education constraint. Do you remember how you worded what you said? I tried writing it down. It's okay. okay. I, um, I have right. this terrible habit of saying things and then not remembering what I, <laughs> what I said like 30 <laughs> seconds afterwards. But um, but it was something akin to um, I wrote this, down, well, I, I, the actively was definitely active part of in ensuring something. Yeah. The superintendent will take an active role in ensuring um, appropriate services for special education students as well as I mean, there was something about this all intake, has to be you know, will not that. and all that. Yeah. Oh, not not really, because number one's different. No, it doesn't yeah, really okay. have to. Like, as long as there's it? a clear definition of what we want, and then yeah, you can do however you want, and just make sure that we get this answer however you feel. I have a I, thought. Could you take the Tulsa two? I don't know if this would be too much of a combo. The superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable for students and shall proactively ensure systems are in place for da 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 da. Or you could make it to keep it in the negative, you could say, including, in, in, uh, superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable for students, including inadequate resources or inadequate. I was just Whatever, thinking, like, how can we tie in, like, the, like, we're all kind of getting at the special education, mm -hmm. and to me, that does fall very tightly with that inequity. Sure, so, I would just hate for um, somebody to in infer that because that's, like, a corollary to this, that that's all we're talking about is special education, and then just get yeah. over things that they're uncomfortable talking about. Well, the other thing we could do is we could say the superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable or insufficient for students. And then when we build the three goals, we could ensure that one of the three goals is specific to special education. Oh yeah. I like yeah, that. I think Perfect. You got it. <laughs> That's why I was like, I'm going down a too much of a combo route, oh, but a good, I wanted to word yeah. vomit and yeah. see where it went. <laughs> that way it keeps it in the frame of mm -hmm. all students, but we make sure that each time as of those specific. three because one of the things i think we walked away as a concern from the from the goals conversation was we really only had the ability to squeeze one subgroup into the measurements mm -hmm. and i know for most of us we really kind of had this desire to directly kind of get at that special education group as well so by making it a goal within this guardrail then that allows us to bring that value back to the table um, and just capture it someplace else mm -hmm. Love it. Um, perfect. Um, I have a thought. One of the ones that Amy and I were talking about that we really liked was Houston. Was it Houston number? Is this a three four? No. Um, or was it wraparound the, wraparound number yeah. two Houston? Yeah. Oh yes, Houston to number two wraparound services. But I think the family resource center that we have historically has been treated almost kind of like its own thing, but it is part of the district and not. And wraparound services technically come from our family resource center, and I believe that depending on who we have in leadership and as a board, is they're going to take you know, if they want to keep it or not. I know it's grant based make it a priority. We don't make it a priority, but I think to the community, our Family Resource Center has been imperative. They have early childhood programming. They have wraparound services. So all these little um, 
constraints kind of live under the family resource and we can be a little bit more explicit with goals if we wanted to under that. But I think because our family resource center is such a pillar to this community and our students and our families, that it should be a superintendent guardrail to make sure that that's something that's always operating and all these SEL and wraparound services kind of live under that family resource center that we have. Um, I think it's kind of the other way around and I think that that's covered under guardrail one and that's why we kind of just skipped over all the Houston ones because we thought so many of the things under Columbus and Houston were included in guardrail one and guardrail two because they're so broad. Wait. In Tulsa guardrail one, which everybody liked already. Oh yeah, yeah. And we don't Tulsa have guardrail two list. pretty much cover everything y'all just talked about. So, or could we ineffective take... implementation of social emotional learning strategies that support <coughs> and learning in a safe, inclusive climate and culture? Like all that is covered. That covers like the family resource center because family resource center covers things that get you to a place where you can learn without being. I understand what you're saying, but the Family Resource Center specifically is something that, let's say we were to lose grant funding from, it would loan no longer exist. So because it's so important, I want to explicitly name that Family Resource Center as a guardrail. So it sets the tone that that's where we get most of the stuff, that it becomes a priority because historically i know that this this family resource center depending on who's the superintendent is the type of treatment or attention or whatever that is it gets so i think um yeah yeah i think, I think where the clash is going to be is um you know if money I, I guess what i'm saying is wraparound services is very broad right and so like um well, yeah, that that Caracolis, yeah, Care Solace is a wraparound service, well, so that would be so yeah. Community justice, whatever the hell, CJs, mm -hmm. those are wraparound services, right? And there could, in the future, be more. When I've taught, discussed ideas that I have, if we end up doing becoming a Vista site, which is fine. I think I'm just asking for two separate yeah. things. I'm not saying that this is not important. I'm just saying that I explicitly would like to see the Family Resource Center as a guardrail. I think that we could maybe like add it to number four so we're not also ignoring the then because if we're i mean i get what you're saying i just feel like if we're going to specifically mention wraparound services then we can also specifically mention the family resource center but then i don't want them to think that that's the only one we're going to focus on and i didn't that could be just another goal family resource center can be its own guardrail a goal you mean interim guardrail or yeah it could be an interim well or, or another option um, that would dovetail the two together is four could be superintendent will not allow the district to operate without students having effective school-based wraparound support systems and access to a family resource center. okay that's, good. that's what i was looking for is a way to combine it yeah. perfect because and the reason that it needs to be and access to is because the family resource center is a single location whereas the prior portion refers to school based right and so when we look at our, our community education department which we value very highly our school based services are largely tied to our ceos our um, our outreach team um, but our uh, family resource center is a separate sort of central district resource that more broadly supports our families and right. as you pointed out um, it, you know, it gets at some of those pre-K needs and a lot of the other you know, the parenting classes, all of those things that lead to creating conditions for our students to be better prepared to enter our school system. So, Yeah, perfect. Now, is the community um, education center, it's separate as the, like the family resource center or is that implied? So the, so the CEOs themselves are each located at every campus has a CEO. So they're 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 helping students get connected with a variety of social No, services. I meant the but there is an additional community education center which is located adjacent to the Excellencia, Excellencia campus. And so we actually do have, you know, when you think about it, we sort of have three tiers of okay. community education support. We have the on-site school support, we have the family resource center, and then we have the community education okay. center, which Largely, while there is some student activity there, like there will be the holiday 
gifts on Friday. Um, typically, the, I think the majority, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Dupin, the majority of the work that's done there is around supporting adults in the community. Yeah. So that's where like our, you know. So can we add that one too? Just access to Family Resource Center and. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. And what? And, and access to community education center. That's what it's called, right? A community education center. Thank you. Perfect. The to a to the. Um, I think they're both the family and the, the community education center. Yeah, they probably should both be the. Sorry. No, you're, you're right. <laughs> so I stayed out of the grammar on the last uh, one because I had already been chastised. So. Going back um, to student outcomes won't change until adult behaviors do. I would like to circle back to looking at something similar to the Houston number one, where we talk about recruiting and providing professional development for teachers. It can be reworded, but I think we need something in there that this, yeah, that the superintendent should be held accountable for how we are getting and retaining and training and supporting our teachers. I think, um, um, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, in addition to that, like, um, whatever we wordsmith this would be, um, as far as the professional development goes, if there's a portion of that would be, I don't know how to word this, um, meaningful and valid, like, that teachers find meaningful and valuable. Differentiated. <laughs> yeah, differentiated. Um, yeah. Because that's been a request. That's been a the request. Time. Yeah, yeah. And Across I'm maybe sure that the district has found out how to fix that. I think it means giving the power to the teachers. I, I think teachers know how to do exactly. it. Exactly. But I'll, I relinquishing the power to the teachers uh -huh. <laughs> is what that is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a to system to. to yeah. The system to recruit, employ, and meaningfully, I don't um, I know. Um, Maybe <clears throat> empower teacher sites and teachers to, I don't know how we can get there. Um, how does this I mean, I think you could remove the employee because I like, well, in the initial one, it was recruit slash employee. Like if you're recruiting them, it's in the implication is you're recruiting them to employ them. Meet the needs of, uh, meet the needs of students needing the most support by or through, by or through or something like empowering or ensuring sites or teachers or whatever you want to say, <laughs> have the like, uh, you know, the autonomy, authority, whatever word you want to use to... Maybe empowering staff. Hear the wording from you two over here. <laughs> maybe empowering staff through relevant and differentiated professional development. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Relevant and sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, relevant and differentiated professional development. One thing I also want us to be aware of is that all of our language should be at sixth grade level and I'm having a really hard time reading number five and understanding it. So also, um, we, we need to that, make sure because this is stuff that we're going to be taking out to the community. So five is jumbo mumble to me. So can we also quickly before we fix those words, can we change it from students needing the most support to just all students? Yeah. Meeting the needs of all students. Because that will also. Thesaurus.com. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I like the word differentiated being in there because that is a word I keep hearing. Yeah. yeah. And I and I think that's something, you know, if, if we're out in the community, I think that's something, um, you know, we can help define for the community because it is important to teachers that they aren't. Right. You know, it's yeah. a support thing for them. And what parts of the, in terms of words you may want to change or tweak and then, or if you want to break this up and make it two, so, I don't know. What are your th thoughts, Sophia? Okay. I'm reading it again. Hold on. Give me a second. 
I feel like some of it too is just removing the wordiness. Like instead of recruit yeah, slash employee, right. just can yeah. we just remove employee? Just say recruit strong T and maybe even remove the train because we've addressed the training at the yeah. end of the sentence. So, yeah, so maybe a that's system to recruit strong teachers who meet the needs of all students by empowering staff through relevant. Well, now we need to, this also doesn't flow. Relevant and different um, professional development. No, I think that works. I was going to say retain. Recruit, and, recruit retain. and retain strong teachers who meet the needs of all students, comma, by empowering staff through. I like that better. Maybe I just meant to say it was too wordy. It was getting too wordy. And there are, well, no, there are education specific strong teachers. words in there, but I also don't want to parse it down so much that it's not meaningful because this is a standard and this is very focused. This is a guardrail focused at what are we providing the teachers and staff? Mr. Mann, how do you, yeah, well, go ahead. So the, well, and I apologize, I'm not gonna respond to this as a superintendent, I'm gonna respond to it as a former English teacher. So the trick I used to teach my students when there's an positive in the sentence is to read the sentence without that. And an positive is that that section of the sentence that's set off by the two commas. Yep. So will you always go back to check your sentence by reading the sentence without uh -huh. that qualifier? And I think if you do that, we have two ideas that are designed to read as one that are actually two. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's gonna create confusion for people. So if I may, it, it would read, the superintendent will not allow the district to operate without a system to recruit and, re recruit and retain strong teachers by empowering staff through relevant and differentiated professional development. So it's defining the recruitment yeah, and retention yeah. strategy yeah. as the PD, which would be, you know, Perfect. asking now Ms. That makes sense. asking Miss Wazol. When I started yeah. reading it again, I was like, the middle part's throwing me. Yeah. So that may be what's to and me that, that was what was making okay. it unclear. Okay. Glad it wasn't just. Um, we improved our flush Kincaid reading ease score when I typed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for validating all those years of study. I didn't do anything. This algorithm did. Oh my God, that's hilarious. Okay, let me read this again. So the superintendent will not allow the district to operate without a system to recruit and retain strong teachers by empowering staff through relevant and different, differentiated professional development. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Now my ADD brain makes sense. <laughs> um, perfect. The only other one thing that I kind of wanted to bring up too is that dual language is very important to this district and our community. Um, the last time that this happened, um, the district decided to stop dual language and for whatever reason it was. However, Osborne was able to maintain their dual language program. So because this is a recurring theme that happens, especially with a lawsuit that's been um, handed down to us um, recently. It's very important to this community. They want this dual language program and I would hate for somebody else to come in, um, you know, and then say, well, too bad we're folding our hands, goodbye dual language again, when that was a big, big um, shocker to this community and they did not like it. So I would, Go up to the wording on number two again. I was going to say, can we embed it in? No, I mean, could we rewrite? Could We can just write one separate. I just want to make sure I, we could just use some of the same language. You know what yeah. I mean? The superintendent. Was... I, I think if you could just, the, number five, the superintendent will not allow the district to operate without a dual language program. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah, as simple as that. It doesn't have to be like, I just think it's no I matter that, how it happens. The thing we run into there is like if if there's a law that gets in the way or. I mean, but there was kind of a law um, the last time and Osborne was able to make it happen. So it's the superintendent's job to make it happen. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there is, you know, we, there's some unknown that could happen that that we can't predict, but I think it is nice to just have it in writing that that's our wish, you know, and it do, it doesn't add any additional work yeah. at the moment. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, it, regardless of whether it did or not, it's work that would need to be done anyway, right? right. So, yeah. you know, if things progress with the lawsuit, it's not like I'm going to be like, well, that's not what you hired me for, right? Like I'm in that hot seat 
either way. So it's not an additional burden to have to take that on by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, clearly I'm a, a champion and an advocate for it. So I'd have a difficult time not supporting it, not just under the guise of a dual language program, but I think it's one of the vestiges of some of the racist policies that have been put in mm -hmm. place in the state over the years that not only in my mind, does that need to go away? Even though it's not under our purview, I think our English only, we're the last state left with an English only law since Massachusetts finally rescinded theirs. And that's a problem to me, both as a member of, you know, somebody who lives in Arizona as a superintendent of, of students and it's also a problem for me as someone who believes in a strong economy for our state, because I think it's one of the things that holds our economy back. Mm -hmm. I think these guardrails and our board guardrails really, um, I know uh, some of us talk a lot about how a lot of boards and superintendents and districts don't stand up for themselves in the state with state um, lawmakers and legislators. And I think that these guardrails kind of really establish who we are and what we mean and if you're not on board, <coughs> bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, and I also think it brings this reassurance to our community when they were asking the questions, you know, when we hit them with the goals and they saw just test, stay testing, test, 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 I think they felt a certain type of way. But now when we bring this back to our community, it's like, we're hearing you, we're taking you, now we're make sh making sure that this, but it lives somewhere else. And I think this is going to be a little bit more understanding and our community is going to understand why, you know, there's board goals, there's superintendent gourds, and they all live somewhere. And this is how it happens. Just like when we hired Jay and we got all the feedback slips that night, I think reading these is like super affirming um, mm -hmm. to know that we're all kind of like, it feels good to be on the same page with your community. Um, and to have each other's back, so to speak. And so hopefully, yeah, it does provide some comfort, reassurance for people. Yes. Well, I think that was the, you know, I mean, we're learning this process as well. I know the community council, it was a much faster version. Like we went through hours and hours and hours. And so I think it really is, it's just, you know, helping everyone understand this entire framework because, we're, a lot of us aren't fans of state tests either, but that is how we are evaluated. And so your goals have to be smart and they have to be tied to something like that. And they're five-year goals too, um, which I know was mentioned, but I think that's important just to emphasize like they're five-year goals because there were comments about like, this seems too lofty or this seems impossible. Um, but that, you know, we'll have those progress monitorings and and that all of the other comments and concerns, like they live in guardrails. And and I just to piggyback off of Katie, like that's I, I was taking notes on the themes and it was wraparound supports and, you know, family and student input and, um, you know, the social emotional SEL, SEL. And and it was it was affirming because I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, even two weeks ago, I was with a basic introduction of guardrails, I'm like, well, this is definitely going to be included. And so to see all that feedback and know these are the pieces that will help us get to those goals and to make sure that we stay focused. And one thing that I've learned through this framework when it comes to testing, and I'll stop talking about that, is like it is a tool that we use, but a lot of people misuse that tool. And I think that's what scares people because it has been misused by certain leaders in the state. So this is building back that relationship that we can assure you that Creighton is not going to misuse those assessments and those benchmarks and those tests to over fatigue kids or make them anxious about this. Um, this is why we're taking time to do this, going back to the community, we're reading, we're, we're doing the work to make sure that those tools are just being used as what they were meant to do and not get involved in these political stunts of how we use these tools with our students. Well, and whether we like it or not, you know, those, there are assessments and, and measurements for districts that directly impact our funding. And it can become, very quickly become a vicious cycle. Yes. You know, and so we need to be very intentional and whether you agree with letter grades or any of that, like it all impacts enrollment and funding. And if we start going down in those things, we start being less able to include these guardrails and meet any any goals at all. So it's the nature of education. It's very complex and we're trying to focus it. <laughs> I, yes. And going to school here in this district and in Phoenix Union for myself at a time when Stanford 9, our aims were like the only thing we did. And it was very apparent even as a kid, like 
why are we writing essays in chemistry class? Because we're supposed to do better on the Ames test or something. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I hate this. Um, and then there was like an Ames countdown clock at my school at one yeah. point, And there were incentives given for people who'd already passed to come retake it. I mean, that's why we have people like Dr. Pombo in these positions who are not going to lead us down that sort of path. And Dr. Okay. Dupin as well, who can get us to a place where we're finding a way to to like change things um, academics wise without making that the focus. And I, I under, totally understand given my own experiences where people are scared of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's a true concern because we've, we've all been there. Um, do you mind scrolling to the top real quick? I'm just gonna reread them real quick just to make sure that we all agree with these and if we are missing anything. And I would love to just, get a little bit of feedback from you to um, Superintendent Mann after I read them, just because this is what you're gonna be held accountable to. <laughs> so the superintendent will not conduct his duties without including students, families, teachers, and community members, inclusive of those that speak languages other than English, in a manner that inspires broad community ownership of board policy. The superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable or insufficient for students. The superintendent will not allow the ineffective implementation of social emotional learning strategies that support effective teaching and learning in a safe, inclusive climate and culture. The superintendent will not allow the district to operate without students having effective school-based wraparound support systems access to Family Resource Center and access to the Community Education Center. The superintendent will not allow the district to operate without a system to recruit and retain strong teachers by empowering staff through relevant and differentiated professional development. The superintendent will not operate the district without a dual language program. Um, the only one that I don't see is the uh, same one that we had as our board number one, where the superintendent will not make any major decisions without community input. No, it, it's there as num it's number one for the superintendent. Oh yeah, it is. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's number four for the board. Yeah. Correct. And, okay, never mind. Yeah. Just and, kidding. Can, and, this is like super nitpicky. Um, on number four, instead of saying the family resource center, the community educate, like, would it be more appropriate to say, uh, be just because we it's already made him switch from A to the, we can no, but yeah, because it could, or, yeah, you know, like change the name or yeah, it felt, and it's, it felt we, weird. We want to the... make sure that we have entities of that, whether right. they change their not name or it's yeah. not a proper noun. <laughs> Um, okay, I see what you're saying. that makes sense, yep. like, or there might be multiple in our district in the future, which would be the great thing, right? You have access to one of five, right? Ooh, I like that. <laughs> so if you say access to A, it means they have at least yep. one. That I need a minimum of yep. one. Okay, I like that. Sorry, it was nitpicky, but also a big thing. <laughs> nope, that's perfect. How do we feel about these? Um, do you have any comments or feedback? Are we in trouble for having six and not five? Well, I, I did notice that the board only gave themselves five in the super. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I would point that out, but um, the last know. one's important. No, I know, <laughs> and the last one is important. The only the only thing I don't see there, um, but I don't know that it necessarily has to be specifically called out. I really did like the one um, that was um, related to student or sorry, related to adult behaviors. Um, but I heard you guys talking about that, but you guys yeah. didn't bring it up. If maybe you can, which one is it? Can you, yeah, Where did we I'm, the I'm Midland all... number two? We wrote yeah. the Midland two. I yeah. did write Midland two. We just got caught really up on like everything else. Is it this one? Yep. Yes, yeah. Oh, yes. And so, and, and the reason I like that one is I often see that being the crux of mm -hmm. you know challenges and problems. Um, is Correct. that. Well, but that, you know, that's going to be hard or that's going to, you know, we've it's something extra to do or we've always done it this way. And it tends to that adult convenience piece tends to be like the top excuse or reason why we can't change something, add something, do something differently. Um, and it also very much aligns to that philosophy of, you know, the adult behaviors need to change in order for the student outcomes to change. Right. Um, my heartburn with adding it at this point is <laughs> seven feels somewhat burdensome. <laughs> but, but. So let me let me help you out a little bit. Um, one, 
Well, I haven't, I haven't mentioned it's when you as a board end up adopting superintendent guardrails, you're also providing cover for your superintendent to go do the work because it's coming from you, right? It's, it's it, although it's done collaboratively with his input as he's given you his input, it is you as a board who are setting those goalposts in regards to the values of your community. So if someone wants to take issue with him on doing one to three measurables on how he's going to get there, um, he's not the kind of leader to say, well, the board's making me do it. I can already tell he's not that kind of leader. But let's be real. The political nature of situations could be, you know, I'm really upset that the superintendent is making some changes and they're calling you or they're emailing you, knowing that your role is to progress monitor, right, and you, you're setting the goalposts then you're also, as a collective team, choosing to stand together to say, well, yes, because these are values that are important to our community as a whole. <coughs> Vetted them with everyone. We got input from everyone. Um, so there is a there is another nature to this that, that really is beneficiary. The other one is the reason I'm not telling you, hey, get them down to five right now. It's have fun taking them to your community and let's see what they say. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So uh, definitely get their feedback. You might pick up some common themes from them. And then maybe your five will become more clear. Okay. Maybe you'll end up having to add an eighth one because you hear a whole different pattern. <laughs> right. Right. That just I did not sign on for an eighth. <laughs> but that's great. But but I will I will not I will not recommend at all to go past five. Again, staying with Franklin Covey's research in the work, you're likely to achieve if you stick to one to three, you're likely to achieve the three. If you do three to five, you can get three to four done. Um, with you all, I think you can get to five especially because you've got four goals that you're proposing and not five. So you're actually going to give him more time to focus on the guardrails as well as he's getting the systems and process off the ground. Um, and just to add a little bit of feedback to that, the for example, like the number one, I think we're just setting a basis, but I think that's something that's been happening and doing, and I think that's one of the things we really have been doing a good job. So I don't think it would be such a – it's almost like one doesn't exist for our super, current superintendent right now because – Obviously, we can always make things better, but I think that's something that's already happening. So even if we do have, you know, more than five, I think it's it's not such a heavy burden at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> He's saying no. <laughs> well, it be, it, it's going to make more sense, too, as we get a progress monitoring calendar together. Right. He and his team are going to be in overdrive to bring right. you the progress monitoring yeah. of the goals and the guardrails. You go past five, you're really going to stretch your leadership team thin. Could, when you do that, because he's going to come up with one to three another measurables. Thought on, okay. Yeah. Another thought on the one, two, it, like if we're trying to reduce to five, since we have one as a board guardrail, we were looking at alignment, but if the board is held to that guardrail, we will be holding you to that anyway. Mm -hmm. So is there, like, I, I love it, but is it re redundancy to also. Yeah, I see on, what you're saying. Because if because at the end of the day, that as a board, we're saying if if he approaches us and says, I would, you know, I'm proposing you vote on this and we already do this and we say, but well, our board girl says input, no, because got it. Yeah, and we're going to we're going to vote no, because you didn't. And then we're we're that's where it falls on us to okay. make sure that we keep you in line. Yes, I like that. We can get rid of number one. Okay. The other point, to, I love the way you're working because when the, the two-way communication will not ideally be just once a year. Right. It would be probably twice a year and not just the first year. Right. It's that you as a board continue to stay in, in communication, two-way communication, not just them coming to the board meeting, but you also, just as what you're about to do and continue to do right now, that you will make that a natural habit for your board. Could we're still at six, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I had a random thought. Could we on number one, not trying to make things super wording, wordy, but could we at the end of it say, um, like somehow add like including um having you know, maintaining a dual language program. But that wouldn't work with a negative language. But because we're like in number one, we're talking about making sure that we don't allow conditions, practices, or procedures that are inequitable or insufficient for students. To us, not having a dual language program means it's insufficient. So is there some, but we also want to make sure we're explicitly calling out the dual language. Is there some way to include the dual language in that? Well, I could, I could add another 
thought here. So I, while I do like calling it specifically out because I do feel like it's topically important at the moment, um, much like with ensuring a special education goal around um, number one, number one. Sorry, I had to readjust because yeah. it used to be number two. <laughs> um, the we, other could we, be we, we, we could ensure one of the three goals for number one is also um, ensuring the ongoing support and viability of the dual language program. So, I mean, that, so basically that would handle two of the three goals for guardrail one. We would basically decide already at this point in time, which gets us ahead again. And you know how, how I get about us being like the, the top of the class, <laughs> you know, we could leave the meeting not only with five um, draft guardrails, but two of the two of the goals for number one established as the one around. Special I see what education. you're saying. So that could be in okay what as an saying? interim goal. Interim guardrail. I mean guardrail. Sorry. It could either be interim or it could be a goal under guardrail one because it really does fit under. I mean, it is an equity an inequitability okay. issue, right? That mm -hmm. our students because the whole point of why they want to take the dual language program around or take it away is that they don't want certain groups of students to have access to it. They're not trying to take it away from kids in Scottsdale. Note that Scottsdale's not included in the lawsuit. Or Littleton. Or Littleton, or Little. yeah. Or, or other, certain other districts. They're trying to take it away from school districts in the Phoenix Central Corridor, in Flagstaff. There, there's It's clearly specific groups of students, and it's clearly based on a desire for inequitability. So it really fits under that inequitable okay. language in, in number one. So just, you know, to support what, what we can uh, take the dual language, yeah, dual language better. one out and we can make it in the, yep. I was just trying to think what, which of these relate to others mm -hmm. that get us to five. Yeah. And hence, by the way, this is what happens when a superintendent understands the board and what the board is trying to to say uh it is it is usually not you know it is not recommended that a board give the superintendent direction on in other words this would be like saying hey these are the roles we do want you to take but you're not you're describing the theme of what you've heard from your community he's hearing you in essence he's hearing your community as well so if he's choosing to come back with interim guardrails around those mm -hmm. student groups everything is the right. communication and the clarity that's coming forth you're you're in sync yeah and and it will be an absolute pleasure to go back with all of you to community council to share these two sets of guardrails because i think it will it ironically is very aligned with board guardrail number four in that we we not only heard what the community had to share with us and what their priorities were I um, mean, we not only included students, families, teachers, and community members in that conversation, but we're coming back with sets of guardrails that directly address the concerns they expressed to us when we met with them at the November Community Council. So that's, that's very exciting to have that opportunity to do that moving forward. A record time, not that that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> uh, I, I will say great, great work and also it is very noticeable to me that you did your homework prior to coming in today and hence why the board behaviors of boards that do their homework and the superintendent of course did his homework teams that do their homework showing up prepared this is this is what that looks like so kudos and congratulations you have now drafted your board goals and you have drafted your board self guardrails and you have drafted superintendent guardrails you are now completely, completely tasked with taking it to the community, as many people as you possibly can. Look for guidance from your board president to, to tell me when you all feel that you've gotten sufficient feedback from as many of your stakeholders as you can. And then we will look to put this on the agenda for adoption. And if there's changes that are going to be brought forth, we will discuss it at the board meeting. And then right after that, that same board meeting, we will do our first official board self-evaluation. Questions, Question, thoughts, or wonders? Um, are we permitted to share the Y guardrails document with our community? Absolutely. Anything that I'm giving to you, it's for you to decide who and how to share. Okay. Uh, oh, one more thing also, before I forget, when when all of this is done and adopted, uh, I highly recommend that you have these printed out uh, for display in your boardroom. Uh, also place these on your website. Mm -hmm. um, and however creative you wanna be, I see you got your cool boxes with your vision and all that. 
whatever way it's going to take for you to memorize your goals and your guardrails, uh, it'll be one of the prompts towards the end of the, the higher end of self-evaluation so no. that you can own, you can own. And if anything, it's not just a memorization. It's really knowing where you're at at any given time in the progress towards your goals. That's going to be the difference between you and many boards around the country. You will not only know what your goals that you set, you will also know at any given quarter where we are in terms of progression because of this, the monitoring that you're going to be doing at your board meetings. And it's going to look like this. I think it'd be helpful once we have our final version to have like a printed copy that on one side has the board and on the other side has the superintendent. Maybe we highlight the like keywords. Mm -hmm. That might be a good, and we have a little laminated like. I also think I wrote down on website and I also wrote down social media. Mm -hmm. Yes, stuff. good. And that's, this is where I encourage you to be super creative, have fun with it. Uh, I'll just give you some examples. One board in South Texas has them printed on the back of their badges. Uh, another board uh, in another part of the country has the board goals on the back of their business cards. That way, every time they give out their business card, oh, everyone cool. in the community knows what the goals are. Just saying, have fun with it, be super creative, whatever way you can continue to educate your community and your stakeholders. Looking forward to seeing what ideas you come up with. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. Do we have any other comments, closing comments? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ramos, for being here with us, and thank you guys so much for reading, taking the time to actually learning this framework and working together to get these goals and We'll, we'll talk a little bit more in the future to see how we can start bringing these in the community. I already have all these ideas coming up in my head that we can bring forth um, to our community. So thank you. Um, Ms. Juarez, we were scheduled at six to start. Okay, so with that, that I'm gonna, if we have no more comments, um, Superintendent Mann, do you have any other questions or comments? No, just uh, many thanks to the board. Um, impressive work and uh, I mean, couldn't have timed it better than a 10 minute break before the regular board meeting. So yes, so with that, we will be adjourning our study session and then we'll be back at six for our regular school scheduled board meeting. Thank you.
everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. If everybody can go ahead and get take their seats. We're going to start off with our land acknowledgement. Creighton School District understands that our community of schools is located on the ancestral land of the Otham, Jude, and Ekema Otham people who descended from the Hohokam and have inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The Otham, whose name translates literally to people, are a vibrant culture and community spanning countless generations into the past, continuing to thrive in the present and carrying a powerful legacy for generations into the future. With this acknowledgement, the Creighton School District formally recognizes that the traditional care and keeping of these lands by indigenous people is an aspirational model of community stewardship that we are committed to honor with practices, policy, and human relations. And Mr. Mann, if you can please um, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Okay, that brings us to our roll call. We have Miss Gibson McLean here, Miss McSheffrey, myself, Miss Ayers, and Miss McCaleb. Brings us to approval of agenda. I move the governing board approve the agenda as presented. Second. Ms. Gibson? I'm sorry. I didn't it's okay. Would you like to make the change? Yes. That we talked? Okay. Yes. So sorry. I'm going to make an, a change and amendment. Um, so I move the governing board approve the agenda as presented with the exception of moving 9A, which is a very long item that I'm not going to repeat at the moment. Um, 9A to before public comments. suggest after governing board reports oh yeah sure. yeah i'm down with whatever you want to see. <laughs> okay so move 9a um and make it like a 4c after governing board um reports okay unless i assume we don't have public comments on that no, oh we have now. it's not going to be after board reports so public comments is okay yeah okay mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Perfect. And that brings us to public comments. It looks like we only have one today, and I would like to invite Miss Dorothy Green. Okay, what? Um, three minutes? Yes, please. And take your time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was had a chance to see some of the work that you were doing during the study session regarding the board goals. Not sure exactly how they're how it's worded what they are, but the board declared goals that you're working on. And then I also saw them at the community council rolled out, and then again at a different district committee. So my understanding is that you guys are looking for some feedback regarding those draft goals, because I know they're still, or I think they're still in a draft form. So I wanted to take that opportunity. First of all, I wanted to appreciate all of you for all your hard work really digging into the data. There was a lot of data presented and you guys really got into it and were really having some rich conversations in those small groups and then came back together. I really like that you targeted different subgroups, um, really looking at that, um, you know, any proportionality issues and really targeting some subgroups in terms of ethnicity. I like that you focused on the English language learners. I guess the only thing that I'd like for you to consider additionally is there are no goals that I saw, that draft goals, that were related to reading. And for me, I'm a reading interventionist, a special ed teacher, focused in early childhood education, and being able to read at a level that allows a student to access high school and career and just life in general at a high enough level is such a high leverage skill that I'd like you to really think about, is there a way to incorporate um, increasing our reading skills among our students as part of those draft goals? Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings us 
to do we have to make the change every time from board updates to superintendent updates no okay it's okay mr mann with your superintendent report no i i appreciate the consideration um last time the board was kind enough to allow me to go second because i knew that board members would be hitting some of the things i'd be commenting on and i'm not a fan of stealing board members thunder so especially with some of the great thunder we have um our current board so um i don't i don't have a lot to share um one of the things i really wanted to do because this is our last meeting before winter break and so i really wanted to wish our students our families our teachers our staff our entire community um, a hopefully restful recuperative um, winter break with family time with with people being able to engage in the holidays that they celebrate but also um to me, very importantly, I want to give a shout out to those teams in the district who will be in here during winter break, ensuring that everything is ready to go when we return on January 8th. Sometimes while we're off relaxing, recuperating, enjoying, and celebrating, we forget the folks that are working really hard. And when we show up on January 8th and they look a little bit tireder than the rest of us, we forget to give them some kudos and credit. So I wanted to make sure we kind of had them in our thoughts and our hearts, um, you know, as we're as we're enjoying that time away. Um, in addition to that, I would just like to share um, that the district, apparently, the uh, government finance officers association has changed the way they do their plaques for our certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting, and so we, it's actually really heavy, um, but it's also a really nice looking one. So we're excited that um, in addition to some of the other new additions that were discussed tonight for the boardroom, um, we'll have this to put up. And while well, right now it only has our 2022 award on it, um, we were expecting no promises, but the expectation is we'll be able to add 2023 to that once all of that work is completed. And then I would like to give kudos to our board. They were recognized last week at the Arizona School Boards Association for receiving the Total Boardsmanship Award. So that will be another plaque we'll be adding to our wall here in the boardroom. And that award represents a commitment among the board members for continuing education and continuing professional development uh, to be excellent in the work that they do. And I think um, for those of you who are able to observe the study session tonight and are aware of the uh, student outcomes focused governance work we've been doing, I think it is a very outcomes focused set of evidence of the hard work our board has put in uh, to do their homework uh, to be the best they can at the job that they do. And that is all I have to share this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Ayers, would you like to start us off with governing board updates? You're going to call me when I add I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we're kind of eating. Um, yeah, um, I want to talk about a little bit about community um, council. I thought that was... I always enjoy going to those and I've only missed one. Um, it was great being able to go around to the tables and, and talk to them about um, the work that the board is um, doing. So um, that was amazing. Um, I just want to thank my fellow boardsmen, um, boards women, for um, doing all this hard work. I feel like we're very um, progressive. We're not being um, in the status quo like some other boards. Um, I feel like we um, have these um, a great vision and a great um, way that we're moving. Um, and I'm really excited to hopefully continue to be part of this board um, in the future. Uh, so um, thank you. And then um, just happy holidays and I hope you all enjoy your break. Ms. McCaleb. Yes, um, I am sad. I missed community council. I was really looking forward to it. Um, but I, in such timeliness, caught the nasty flu stuff that had been going around. Um, so I felt that nobody would be upset if I didn't share that. So, but I really appreciated um, we were able to receive a lot of the written feedback. So just to anyone who was there and, and helped provide that feedback, I really appreciate it because I wasn't able to attend and that was very important in guiding um, our next steps and reflections on the work we've been doing and continue to do. Um, I was able to go to ASBA last week, um, really enjoyed 
a number of sessions I went to. Um, I won't belabor all of the keynotes, but there were there were some pretty good like tangible, applicable keynotes, which you don't always see. Sometimes it's just the like inspire. Um, but they had some, they had some really good whole group keynotes talking about school finance and game plans and and how we can do all that. Um, I also attended a session um, led by our own Russell Denault on cybersecurity for board members. That was very interesting and just a good reminder that, um, you know, there, there will be inconveniences as technology changes and as we have to put in other layers of protection. Um, we recently all had to do the multi-factor authentication as board members, but it is so important um, especially how quickly technology evolves, that we all remember that we hold very valuable, important, you know, personal information about students and staff, um, regardless of, you know, how you're staffed in the district and knowing that you have an amazing IT department um, and district cabinet that is staying aware and alert and informed um, and making sure that everyone in this district is safe and protected. Um, went to, I'm a, I'm a tech nerd, so I went to a couple, um, pieces about AI as well, which was really interesting. But um, some of the other ones, um, I was able to go to a session about serving students who are at risk or expected to be at risk for homelessness or unsheltered um, and got a few valuable tools from that as well. Um, I think the hard part was there was a lot of back and forth with the audience and we kind of all walked away with a feeling of like we're doing so much in our districts and our communities, but there was definitely a call to action that our counties, cities, and state need to step in because we feel, unfortunately, like we're putting a lot of band-aids um, on a much larger problem, which is the lack of affordable housing um, in our area. So, um, and then one of the other sessions I went to that I really enjoyed was about supporting Native American students in our schools. And um, the Office of Indian Education is a department within ADE. They used to be super, super small, like one person. Um, and so often when people think of OIE, they think of, well, that's where the districts go for help with grants and to make sure we're being compliant. Um, but they have expanded to five members and are hoping to continue to expand. And a part of that has been um, providing professional development to staff and schools around how to be um, have cultural competency for our Native American populations, um, especially when we don't necessarily have that many teachers who reflect that population. So um, it was just very interesting to learn more about what they have to offer. They're, they partnered with one school district to really create a customized resource of professional development and work directly with their teachers. And it was just really inspiring to see that. I think Creighton's done an amazing job as far as our family engagement um, and educating about the culture and honoring the culture. But I know that there's more we can do to equip our teachers with helping make sure we serve the needs of those students in the classroom. So um, that was a very quick recap of a three-day conference, but it was very valuable as always. And um, just ditto on the enjoy all of the holidays. If you are still working tirelessly, thank you. Um, if you get a break, please take an actual mental break and take care of yourselves and enjoy time with your friends and family. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. McSheffrey? Yeah, um, I uh, wanted to hold um, my board update on the um, student outcomes focus governance conference that I went to with Mr. Mann in San Diego back in, uh, I don't know, months ago, <laughs> seems like, but October, so not too long ago. Um, <clears throat> this conference had a really different feel than anyone I had gone to before, and I think it was because it's, it's, you have to be a member. You don't have to be a member. It, it's membership that you have to apply for. We are currently not members, but we are partaking in the student outcomes focused governance, which is where um, this came from, is this organization. Um, and so uh, Mr. Mann and I went to a session together that was given by, I think it was Columbus City Schools um, out of Ohio, who um, was uh, uh, Dr. Ramos gave some um, examples of some things that they have been doing. So I think they're kind of a highlight district for student outcomes focused government. Um, and I believe they're 12K because, um, uh, K-12, I'm sorry, um, because uh, they've got high schoolers as well. But 
they, one of the things they did is they have a series of 30 minute videos for their community um, where they, you know, talk about different subjects. They talk about things like special ed, what your, what your kind of rights are and define special ed acronyms. That, that was one 30 minute session, um, which I thought was great because that's something that um, as a parent who's not an educator, that's something that is a huge learning curve for parents. Um, they have a parent university for elementary kids and they have teachers involved and pay them for this extra time. They And, and this whole conference had so much student voice in it. Now, some of them are high schoolers. A lot of them were high schoolers who we heard from, but student voice was really, really important um, to this organization. Um, and and we heard i don't know if we were in this session together mr man but um there was a new superintendent who did a listening tour who um and i don't want to put you on the spot at all <laughs> mr man um but he did nine different types of listening tours throughout his district and then he ran into a student which was like well you know you haven't you haven't heard from us <laughs> so he and he just he loved getting that feedback um um, and then he he did some more tours with students. Um, and, you know, someone had made the comment that students need voice, but they also need support. Like, they don't know the acronyms either, what ESSER is, what Title I is, what any of the special ed um, acronyms are or other acronyms that we use all the time. Um, lots and lots of these districts had student advisory committees um, and mental health was a very important um, subject. Um, and I'm just going to tell you some of the takeaways that I came out with, and I think it will resonate with you board members now that we've been working on this SOFG, because really that was a subject that was happening a lot. And some of the, sub some of the, the sessions I went to were more for staff, I would say, than governing board members. And that was a little different too than, than like NSBA or ASBA, I feel like, um, when it comes to mental health for kids, you can't do it alone. You must have partnerships. We just talked about that tonight. Um, I think it's Columbus City Schools use a company called Hazel Health. It's a it's a telemedicine um, mental health company, and they have a crisis center and an intake facility. Um, suicide is something very much on their radar because they're you know it's older kids. Unfortunately, it, it does happen with younger kids too. Um, their goal. And this was a theme that I keep he hearing about over and over again. Their goal was you could walk up to any student in the school and that student can tell you who they can go to if they're facing a crisis. So each school created a video of each person on their crisis team so kids could recognize them. That was like the beginning of the school year um, video that they watched. Um, again, they, they had a Google form that kids and parents can fill out at the beginning of the school year to get know, to know more about them. And if there are any specific SEL needs, you know, they said all schools need to have access to SEL curriculum. Teachers need to be modeling SEL skills and say no to silos. The behavior belongs to everyone in the school. That was something I heard over and over again. Um, don't continue to let, blame a lack of counselors or staff for SEL issues. This is an everybody approach and we need to build the capacity of those we have as well as our parents. So that's something that everybody has to be able to help with. Um, their marketing team recorded students talking about mental health so, to, so that there isn't a shame surrounding it. Um, and they said, you know, don't hide from your behavioral data, your suspension data. Kids are telling us what they need. The behavior is a form of communication, which I think is so true. Um, it's not a time for us to push them out when they're having behavioral issues, but to for us to push in and, and see how we can help them. Um, and also look at classroom management um, as well as instruction. If instruction is boring, Students will not be engaged, and it's in, an invitation for behavioral problems. Um, and HR, how are we onboarding people? Do we have questions about SEL, restorative practices, if they have any um, experience with these things? Um, people need training, but there's also needs to be a willingness to respect another culture, which I think is a, a challenge we are facing as a humanity right now. Um, and just some things that came up in, again, I think it might have been the same session. Um, but, you know, I think these are 
courageous things that were happening at this conference that I haven't seen at an NSBA, for example. When it comes to an HR standpoint and cultural, um, you know, uh, competence, you know, you either change people or change people, <laughs> you know, um, and a restorative justice reentry plan, student identification of a caring adult at the school was something that they they made sure to do at reentry, and then this person is notified that you're 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 identified as a, a a safe person for this kiddo and and they're they're coming back you know um so those are just some of the takeaways um that i um came from you know that that a kid everyone in the school should know who that kid's safe person is and if you don't know who it is they don't have one so um and it doesn't have to be their classroom teacher it can be anyone on campus but I thought they just were having some really courageous conversations about things like this. Um, and I would say because we're working on this SOFG, it's, it's a, you know, mandatory conference for everybody to try and hit um, next year. And then just uh, on another note, we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't had any school visits. Um, I haven't um, this semester. So I have heard feedback that um, staff would like to see our presence on campus. So I'm going to get with Hilda and Mr. Mann. And, um, I, you know, I don't think it's mandatory that, you know, everybody has to go, but, um, I would like to be on campuses next semester and see what's going on. Cause I always get a positive feedback from that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gibson McLean. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, going back to community council, um, you know, I know it was like a cold and rainy night for our standards at the community council, and a lot of folks were sick. Um, and so while I was kind of sad that there weren't as many people there that we normally have at community council, I still felt like, um, you know, and I feel this all the time, but like whoever's in the room is whoever's meant to be in the room, and we're going to have the conversations. And I think we, our community did a great job having those conversations. Um, I really appreciate our ability to review the feedback that um, we got directly from the community about our goals and about prospective guardrails. Um, and I think in addition to that, just like the, uh, I had said in the study session, when we were going through the final hiring process with Jay, being able to get kind of real time feedback from our community is so helpful and reassuring. Um, it feels good to feel like you're making decisions that are on the same page as people in the community and to be in alignment in some way or in, in the majority way. Um, let's see here. Another thing about community council this time that I really enjoyed was um, our active role as a board in the meeting. I feel like we can definitely take this on more. I think that we are supposed to be community facing. Um, all of us, I mean, there's two teachers, community organizer, former educator, you know, someone who works in an industry that involves a lot of FaceTime um, or has. And so um, I think we're all fit for that and we're willing and ready to take that on. And so I think if we can, if we continue to be included in some way rather than just an introduction, I think it's helpful um, also to really do what um, Dr. Ramos mentions a lot, which is having having Jay's back and having our administrations back when maybe their decisions or the work that's being done is getting called into question so that we can say, no, we're, um, we're the ones who've directed them mm -hmm. to do this work and, and we're here, this is the buck stops with us. And so we'd love to f field your questions and answer and, and have conversations and like really get to know that and make sure that we are aligned. Um, Cause we're not always gonna be happy and in the same flowery space, but if we can figure out how to approach that when the flowers are gone, then we'll do much better when that happens. Um, as far as the student conduct committee, I think we're finally getting in our groove. We have um, another meeting this Thursday at 5 p.m. here in this room. Again, if you've missed any of those, our meetings are recorded. They're open meetings pursuant to open meeting law. You can watch online. You can submit public comment. You can come in person. And those are um, coming up. We're going to schedule 
a few more at this upcoming meeting. Um, but again, this Thursday at five in this room, we ended up having to do a little switch up in leadership. So we do have a new chair. Um, Mr. Diaz, uh, James Diaz graciously has taken over as chair and Mr. Alan Hirsch is our new vice chair. And so um, I'm excited to continue the work that we're doing there. Again, Jay and I are ex officio members and um, there's just some good work going on there. What I will say though is, you know, we do plan on bringing our work to community council in the future or other ways that we can get get feedback from the community. And I know it's hard because it's one other thing to add to people's plates, but honestly, if there's even a way for you to submit a written public comment or maybe take some time to review what we've done so far or speak with any one of us uh, that's on the committee or ex officio members of the committee, it'd be great to have some progress monitoring or some feedback as we go along. And so if there's anything people are seeing or hearing, you know, please, please share with us. It's hard to shoot in the dark and have it be operating in such a small uh, group. I would hate for us to get to the end and get to the feedback and then be totally off, off target, but we'll see when we get there. So just encouraging attendance or comment or any kind of messages whatsoever. Um, and then just feeling good about student outcomes focused government and our governance and our um, progress so far in our uh, study sessions. We've done a lot thus far um, and it feels great. I hope folks have the opportunity to take some rest over the holidays and over the winter break. Um, you know, I know sometimes it's a scary time for some students um, to be uh, seeing a break coming up for many different reasons. And so I just want those uh, students and also some families who feel that collectively to to remember that <clears throat> there are resources available in our district that to help you um, and and to not hesitate to reach out or be too proud to reach out for those. Thank you, Ms. Gibson McLean and Ms. McSheffrey. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. From the conference, um, there was a really cool um, session I went to about donors cho choose <clears throat> in the state of Hawaii. Um, they, um, Kathy Hoffman did this too, but not on such a large scale. They they matched, um, not matched, but did a like a contest grant thing where uh, they funded donors choose projects for a ton of classrooms. And then they um, also did a research project um, with a couple colleges and Donors Choose. Um, you know, it could have turned into a giant Donors Choose um, commercial <laughs> this session, but um, they found that uh, Donors Choose projects um, was correlated to stronger retention for teachers. And um, I know sometimes donor shoes is a little, um, can be a little tricky. There's a little, some pros and cons to it, but um, I think the, the sentiment that I got out of there was that, you know, teachers who feel supported um, and teachers who get the materials they want um, and also knowing they cannot take it with them <laughs> because it now belongs to the district. Um, it, it, fueled retention. So I think um, that was just kind of a cool story. I wouldn't have thought that that was um, something that they I would come out of there with. But um, Creighton does have a lot of donors. Not a lot. I would say I saw about 10. Um, and they're not really funded. So if you're looking to, um, you know, give a Christmas holiday thing, you know, check them out. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to repeat a lot of the stuff. I was also there at the ASBA annual conference. And when we're talking about students being present and it being student focused, this is the first time I've been on the board of directors for ASBA for the past three years. And this is the first time that I actually saw so much student performance, which was gratifying to see. We're a statewide school board association and Per usual, we usually leave our students out. So we had marching bands there. We had a live banda sinaloense from Summerton, I believe it was, which was amazing to see. We had folklorico dancers. Um, we had three different bands and it was so cool because they did like a band off and I had never seen that like in person. I mean, I've gone to the high school ones because my nephews and the Mesa band and they won their band competition. So yay for them. Um, but it was just so cool to see it live and how the kids were involved and how everybody was like, thank you guys for coming and how they got to travel and really show off their talents throughout the state of Arizona. So that was great to see. Uh, yeah. Oh, and then the hoop dancers, I wasn't there cause I was in Mexico, but 
um, yeah, that was great to see. So um, one of the greatest, we had a lot of breakout sessions. The financing was really good. I think as school board members, they gave us like a broad of what financing and budgeting is, but to have um, the superintendent from Tolleson Unified really break it down and go through some more steps was really nice to see, especially because we had a lot of new board members there. Um, so that was awesome. And um, along with ASBA, I saw that all of our schools in our district have signed up for the final four competition that they're having and that it's a little bit of a literacy program for third graders. I believe it's all the third graders in the schools, but it looks like all the principals signed up for it. So that's an incentive to get um, the kids reading. And once in April, whatever school district or whatever school gets the most kids to read a certain amount, they're doing a, a whole thing with the actual final four. So it's really nice to see that they're partnering, ASBA is partnering with um, school districts and really bringing out the students. Um, they had an art competition for the first time, which was great to see. We love art. We have that in our in our boardroom too, is really being student um, centered and focused because at the end of the day, that's what we do all this stuff for is, is, our, is our kiddos. Um, I really enjoyed the breakout session that Mr. Mann was in uh, with the surveys that we've been doing with our staff. That was great to see. I don't believe, I believe our district and Wilson district has been one of the only districts to actually do this whole inclusive staff survey. We got to see a little bit of the numbers and it's really eye-opening to see what we're really getting the feedback from. Um, things that we think we're doing amazing and we're like, yes, communication is there, it's going great. And then you go back to the actual people who need that communication. They're like, no, you're not doing a really good job. So it was really awesome to see. Um, um, cafecitos. So I've been going to the cafecitos and the schools. I really appreciate Ms. Juarez putting on the events of all the schools. Um, those usually get put in the board um, reports or updates that we get on, on a biweekly matter. So I've been taking advantage of those and I'm just really appreciative to the staff, the parent liaisons that allow me to just sit in there and just be a fly in the room and connect with the parents. Um, so those cafecitos have been good and I've been learning some stuff too. You know, we had some uh, seesaw. Um, it's an app that we use. I have a second grader in the district and I learned some new features that I didn't even know existed. So I ended up learning something while I was in there um, as well. And going back to your homelessness talk, um, this is a conversation that actually um, Mr. Mann and I had. I don't know who else is going to the NSBA National School Board Association, but over there um, we do it in Washington, D.C. because we get to bring some of the you know, concerns that we have at a federal level. And when Mr. Mann and I were talking, we, we noticed that McKinney-Vento is something that when our, our children cannot qualify for McKinney-Vento until they're completely, absolutely considered unsheltered, right? And there's no assistance in between in the transition of. So a lot of the times it's a little too late, like you're already out without a without a shelter, without anything, and then McKinney-Vento can kick in. So that's one of the things that we were going to try to bring to this National School Board Association and make sure that our um, federal elected officials are knowing that, yes, McKinney-Vento is great, but it really doesn't do anything for our families and our students in, the, in that moment of the 24 hours of we need to go, what happens then? So um, that's a talking point that we've been talking um, and hopefully we get the opportunity to talk to some of our senators over there, um, seeing how that can be expanded or fixed because there are a lot of loopholes in McKinney-Vento that could be better servicing our families and our students. And that's all I have for the board update. Oh, no, I don't know. I have one more thing, community council. It was great to see everybody and I just wanted to use this time to, one of the biggest concerns there um, at community council when we were going over our board goals was that they were very heavily on tests and you know how over exhaustion of students can happen and making teachers just focus on tests and tests and tests. Um, one of the things I've been learning through this framework is that um, assessments and benchmarks and tests are all tools that even us as adults in our jobs get based and, you know, quizzed on to make sure where we are at. 
Um, one of the things that we can say as the board is that that tool um, historically has been misused by certain leaders. And that's something that here at our district that we, we do not plan to use those tools as an added on burden. We tend to use those tools what they were intended to do is just look at the data and see how we can improve. Um, I know we had a lot of those talks with a lot of um, several parents that were really concerned that we were gonna take away from the things that we've been doing, but thankfully um, we had a study session today where we were able to complete the drafts of board goals, guardrails, excuse me, and superintendent guardrails and a lot of those that feedback that we had and a lot of those concerns, they actually were embedded within the drafts of the guardrails. So we're really excited to take the opportunity to bring it to the community and hopefully give our community a little bit more of ease that it's not just going to be the test, that we do really take um, the community's voice seriously when it comes to wraparound services and the Family Resource Center and all these other wonderful things that we have in the district. And that is the conclusion of my board update. So that will bring us over to our 9A, um, which is to consider and, if deemed acceptable, adopt a resolution authorizing the lease purchase of certain energies conservation measures. Madam President, members of the board, um, this is a follow-on to the discussion item from our last board meeting around uh, the solar initiative for the district. And um, if it would be okay, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Shapiro to kind of walk us through um, the next steps in order to implement that solar program. Yes, thank you. Um, Madam President, board members, and Superintendent Mann, we are asking the board to approve a resolution allowing the installation and guaranteed savings agreement for the energy project that was presented on November 14th board meeting by the Verigy team. Um, we are also lucky to have Mr. James Giel from Gus Rosenfeld and uh, the Verigy team, yes, uh, here to answer specific questions about the project. Um, uh, the resolution allows us to move forward into the lease purchase agreement, which we'll be signing um, with Madam President next Wednesday, I believe, uh, November 20th, and um, also approves the, and authorizes us to enter into those agreements. I'm not sure the specific questions, but we are all happy to answer any questions you might have. Do we have any further comments or questions? I think we kind of got them all out of the way when they were first presented. Um, and just to wrap it up, I, I'm really excited for this. I know that um, as our new school is getting built and as we get an update, this really ties in with what we're doing and implementing in the district. So it becomes a full circle. Um, what we're saying and what we're doing should be followed by our policies, by what we're approving, what we're not approving. And this just feels like it's in the move in the right direction, especially with all the cost savings. And for me, it really is reassuring to know that there is a statute out there that if they're not doing what they need to be doing, we're still going to get compensated for that. So um, it's it's kind of an easy for us. Um, I have to say the whole thing, right, Ms. Juarez? Okay. <laughs> so sorry. Let me take a little, little drink. No wiggle yes, room. please. <laughs> I win <laughs> for the longest one. I move the governing board consider and, if deemed acceptable, adopt a resolution authorizing the lease purchase of certain energy conservation measures within the district from Verigy LLC or an affiliate through a tax-exempt equipment lease purchase agreement with a bank or financial institution as determined by the district, authorizing the execution of various documents relating to such energy conservation measures and the financing thereof, and delegating to the district superintendent and assistant superintendent of business and development the authority to select the lesser and escrow agent and complete such documents within the parameters set forth in the resolution. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. Motion passes, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of that, so thank you. I, I believe so. <laughs> okay, that brings us to approval of consent. I move the governing board approve consent agenda items A through E in accordance with policy BEDV-E. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. And that brings us over 
two, approval of the qualitative data portion of the standard evaluation. And I believe we will be turning it over to our Executive Director of Human Resources, Dr. Lauren. Change of scenery. <laughs> yes. Uh, President Carrillo Dahl, members of the board, I uh, have Tyson Myers is alongside me to help present this uh, information to you this evening. Uh, so we wanted to bring this to the board for approval. Uh, we are in a situation now where we do not currently have an adopted measure for third through eighth grade teachers for the, just the data portion of the standard evaluation system. And that is what we're here to present this evening, is a proposal for that, uh, and then some rationale behind uh, the selection process. Just to show that it's grounded in statute, uh, this is related to ASRS or ARS 15-537, uh, which uh, um, lets people know that the governing board prescribes specific procedures for a teacher performance evaluation system, which includes the data portion specifically. This is a reminder of where that data portion sits in our standard evaluation system. Uh, the overall classification score for teachers is based on 100% uh, score and 67% of that is classroom observations. So when you hear teachers talk about their formal observation cycle, that's what that's referring to. So in statute, 67% of their final evaluation score for the year is based on that. Uh, the rest of the data, the 33%, is based on classroom level or other types of data that are appropriate for the teacher. Within that 33%, if you look at the expanded uh, circle, the green and the blue, growth is represented by 70% in that score, and achievement is represented by 30%. So how far did students come during the course of that school year? And where were they on proficiency level based on the metrics that are used to provide that information? Just to give you, oh, I'm sorry, yes. May I have a question? I'm sorry. Um, this 30% achievement and growth 70%, is that something that we decide on? No, that is in statute. Okay. So that's part of the evaluation system. Those are the standards that were set by the State Board of Education. Got it. it it's adjusted over the years as well. Uh, so it used to be a little bit higher ratio, but this is what they've remarked. Um, it's been, what, five or six years, seven years? It's been this level. 2015, I think, 2015. right? Okay, Tyson doesn't know. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so in this process, just to review our timeline for this year, going back to the last few years, you remember that we were using exact path um, for the data portion of this and exact path had uh, some different sorts of measures. We were using scale scores for achieve for um, growth and then we were using skills mastered for achievement. It was looking at ELA language arts uh, and reading and math. Um, when we moved away from exact path into Renaissance DNA, which is our current benchmarking system, we uh, got rid of the exact path product and we're relying on uh, DNA as our means for measuring student growth throughout the year. Um, you'll see the uh, kind of the timeline there. I'm not going to read you the whole slide, but the important thing I think is that when we made that decision to move from DNA uh, from exact path to DNA, it then created a void in the standard evaluation system where we didn't have data that was aligned for third through eighth grade teachers who teach ELA, math, or both. Uh, so what we did is we convened our evaluation committee. Uh, that committee, again, were uh, made up of those, that committee structure is made up of volunteers. Um, they self-select to be part of that group. Uh, we met in early August or September. Uh, we talked about a couple of different options that Tyson had sort of uh, beat up a little bit and sort of looked at what would make sense and how would it make sense with this with these data. Uh, 
it was brought to executive team. And so we looked at it and did the same process. We looked at what Tyson was recommending. We also recognized that when we had our curriculum department adopt sort of that idea of the 10% or 10, 10 growth model, that would be reflected in the data that we would use in some way. So those were sort of the, the benchmark guide rails, uh, guardrails that we had for this conversation. We did, as a committee, land on one of the two options uh, and then sent that option out for feedback. So we went to our leadership team to get feedback from principals and coaches. We went to uh, out to CEA and asked them to share it with their, their stewards to see if we can get some feedback from the community. And we sent out a survey. We did get some feedback from teachers on the survey. It wasn't as robust as we would have liked, uh, but there were some very thoughtful comments and considerations that were part of the conversation moving forward. Um, in that time, we also had in, had administered one of the benchmarks. So now we had the pretest and the benchmark. So teachers can start to see their path uh, toward the end of the year in an area that hasn't been officially adopted as our SES. So we're, we're we know that we're kind of in a backwards mode in this year for the data. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means when we move forward. We also then came back in November, once we got all the feedback together, presented it back to the committee and they recommended that we bring that proposal to the board. Uh, members of the evaluation committee are, are listed. There were a couple of teachers that had signed up that uh, weren't able to attend the meetings. So unfortunately I didn't feel like I could put them on the list because I didn't want to represent that there were other people in the room, in the virtual room that weren't there. So here are the recommendations uh, for the growth portion. And this represents 70% of that, 33% of the pie. Uh, the goal for growth is that 80% of students will make 10% growth from pre to post assessment. So it's pretty straightforward. So looking at the total from the pre-test at the beginning of the school year in August to the post-test at the end of the school year in May, we want to see students grow 10%. For achievement, 27% of the LA students and 22% of math student scores will score in either proficient or highly proficient on DNA. Those numbers came from last year's district average for our AASA scores with a bump of 10%. So I'm going to let you look at that for just a moment mm -hmm. and see if you had any questions about that. So There's what, more information to follow. What was the rate of growth on exact path like last year then? Just so I can get, get You know, I don't have that information, Tyson. I have that. The rate of growth last year. Exact path is actually. Apples to oranges. Yeah, that's what I, I was yeah, going to say. It's kind of apples to footballs. Was, or is, it not, is it not like exact path? I guess I'm just wondering. You just said. I get the 10% bump for the second portion. It doesn't quite make the same sense for the first portion. And so I'm just asking how we landed on 10% growth, basically. That was part of the conversation with the curriculum department at the beginning of the year, wanting to see 10% increase. In okay, scores. so just, okay. And if I may jump yeah. in real quick, it aligns back to our strategic goal, which was to effectively reach or exceed the state average within a three to five year time span. Gotcha. So if we broke that up into equal parts, it requires about a 10% increase per grade level per year between now and then to close the gap. And we were saying our goal, you're saying the goals that we sent to the or the ones that you guys had and then kind of tried to align with? The second. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was where we did that goal setting you know, to start the school year because we knew we wouldn't have the student yeah. outcomes focused governance. And I mean, there's a strong sense of alignment based on the conversations that we've had. Um, and then this is also where, and I've got to give Dr. Pombo credit because she came in and she did this for everybody. So I've seen everyone from principals to teachers to, to staff to students, you know, it's a goal you can know. If you just do this, you know what that goal is. I don't think we've had as well understood of a goal in past years. And I think the more confusing a goal is, the harder it is to set it 
as a growth target for staff to achieve if nobody really knows what that growth target means. And these are things, um, these recommendations are interim goals that we can be putting in, correct, as from our um, board goals? Yes, and, and these, these are technically what are being used for evalu evaluation purposes, but they align to those interim goals. And what we can look at for future years is, do they continue to align to the new board goals once they go from draft to formal? And if they don't align, then obviously this is an and technically capable of being an annual process, okay. and the team could always go back and, sorry, realign these goals to the new student outcome focus goals. Yeah, I think in my head, I'm thinking of this as a bridging year okay. um, because we have the sunset of exact path, the the rising up of the DNA data and the um, student focused outcomes governance process. So I think all of that sort of converges uh, a little bit later on. So I'll, I'll steal my thunder. I won't read that slide, I promise. Uh, but we do plan to bring the evaluation committee back together in the spring to look at post second benchmark data to see how we're aligned with that possible outcome, that 10% growth, or what the, those achievement scores might do for teachers. Um, they, they very cleverly in the benchmark split it up so that if a student shows 3% growth first uh, quarter, 6% growth the next quarter, 9%, then we know that they're progressing in a way that would show that they'd be successful in achieving that 10% on the AASA. I had two questions. Yep. My first question is, can you just quickly tell me how like Renaissance DNA, how it works? So there's like a benchmark in the beginning and then when's the next one? I think the second one was in October. Is that okay. Right? Quarterly, right? So it's so they're off quarterly. quarterly cycle. It's um, so okay. the August, October, okay. and then I'll let Tyson. Okay. This is his deals so, so um so first of all our our benchmarks are aligned to the aasa they're called actually mimics inside the dna platform okay um so they're aligned to um, a standard a standardized test we broke the year up into kind of trimesters so we have 11 weeks of instruction and then we have our first benchmark we have another another 11 weeks of instruction uh, which ends puts us at the end of january huh. and we have another 11 weeks before the opening of the state window so we're we're trying to kind of chunk and chew. Um, we've also chosen not to give benchmarks at the end of the quarter because teachers are grading, they're getting ready for conferences. Now that conferences have been shifted around, we'll have to look at our calendar for next year, but that's how we chunked it up for this year. Okay. Are and you um, following up to that one just really specifically, um, in the past did you do three? Was it a mimic of three as well? Uh, for the past few years during the pandemic, I'm looking at Eric. During the pandemic, was it about the same time we did the diagnostics? We had a very, we had a very similar structure. For, mm -hmm. I would say since probably, 19, since since, since prior to the four years. Yeah. Should we expect the benchmark after winter break to be adjusted in, or to be different in some way than the first and third? Because of uh, it's a different test, but it's still aligned to the same uh, standards. I guess I meant more so that there's a period where you're out of school and there's an interruption in instruction the other two segments it seems like you have more consistent instruction time we're short time. about a week okay, because the first benchmark wasn't given until two weeks after fall break all right so we're off about a week and we and we're counting cal instructional weeks not right. calendar weeks gotcha. so all it's right. 11 weeks of instruction 11 weeks of instruction okay. which kind of puts a, a little op cycle and we're trying to really maximize the amount of time we have from the the second benchmark to the opening of the aasa window Thank you. Okay, my second thing is just an observation, and this is something that worries me. Um, not worries, but just a concern. So the the committee is made up of the majority of people are admin, which we're talking about teachers, um, and I like to see like an equal amount of representation. Um, and the second thing is this is affecting three through eight teachers, and there is not one single three through eighth grade teacher on this committee. And that is a concern of mine. Yep, I, not for lack of trying to recruit. Uh, when I was looking at the list of people who volunteered for the committee, I recognized that that was a gap. I sent information out to principals, asked for recommendations. The names that came back were representatives of those areas, and they were not representative in this population because of the meetings. 
I have right. a question for whatever reason, and it, and I, I, yeah. um, that is critical, absolutely, mm -hmm. and that I think part of the part of having principals and coaches have input as well. They're very protective of their teachers and their teachers' data, so I think that that was at least another way to get a different perspective. Not exactly what what obviously your concerns would be addressing, um, Sarah's, but. That's sort of where we landed with this. My concerns is that this seems to be a common theme, maybe in other districts as well, mm. um, where it's very offset with admin versus teachers when it affects the teachers the most. Um, and maybe that could have been an area where we could have asked maybe Kelly to get people. And maybe we need to promote the importance of being on committees among teachers mm -hmm. because I, I, I feel like this is to me unacceptable that we don't have at least a couple teachers representing that grade level whether they wanted to or not i feel like we should have found one i mean i also have a question when you stated that you sent the list to the principals and they sent recommendation is this not a free-for-all like a uh, open communication hey this committee just opened we're going to be talking of this whoever wants to sign up can sign up there, or that, is, that is part of the sign up process for committees. So the, the committee process goes through our Creighton communicator. Uh, there are opportunities for teachers to look at all of the committees that are mm -hmm. available to sign up for. And sometimes the ones that don't seem as engaging or meaningful, maybe are the ones that maybe don't get the high level of interest. So the teachers that are in the room and participating and passionate about it are the ones that are going to be participating. Um, I do think that we can do better in getting that representation. Um, I am open to suggestions for the future to make sure that we're meeting that need. One thing I was just going to bring up is I think, you know, as we start to move forward um, in the directions that we're going, there, and this isn't the only place where we might see this, but there may just be a track record of distrust and processes and systems and committees and actual substantive work and the value of that work getting done or feeling like if things are, your time is being valued. And so I know we're going to come up to some of that resistance or some of that apathy when it comes to that. And we have to be ready to, I then, my next thing I wrote down was meeting folks where they're at. I know that's going to take some extra work. On, on leadership behalf, um, but whatever that takes to meet folks where they're at and make these things accessible to teachers is I think what we really need to focus on. I, I think gonna, that's, oh, sorry, I mean the cover. I was just gonna piggyback on that because I think maybe it doesn't, we don't want survey fatigue, but getting some input, not just about this committee, but committees in general from the teachers on what, what are the obstacles? Is it, I don't feel like my time will be valued, is it, I can never make those meetings at that time. Um, it, again, a little more effort, but you know, is it worth having an offshoot of like, well, these teachers can't attend this regular meeting, but they can attend, get some work done, and that feedback can go. Like, but it's and it's not just our district; it happens everywhere. And I think teachers are tired, <laughs> um, and a whole other level of teacher tired. So, but but we want them to be involved and and letting them know how important it is that they have voice in this. I mean, yeah. at least getting one a three through eighth grade teacher, could we not get one or two? I mean, literally, I just, I, I mean, how many employees do we have? Because I can do that in my district as a past president. I could fill every single committee every single time. I, I think one of the challenges we have is that in the, and kind of speaking to um, uh, Ms. Gibson McLean's comment, I believe there is, and, that, and this is what I've heard in feedback as I've been talking with staff, there's a feeling that the work of the committees hasn't always been valued and that sometimes there haven't really been outcomes from the committees. And so one of the things we've really tried to do this year is establish as a new norm that the committees do their work, whatever recommendations are coming forward or being brought forward from those teams and that they're being given the freedom and the leeway to do that work and so um, one of the things i intentionally did to try to help change the culture is visit with each of the committee teams so i popped in i may have missed one somewhere along the way but i think i've been to all of the different committee groups that are working to basically share that message with them to say please know you know we're shifting the culture we are going to value the work that you do and we're going to bring forward what those recommendations are um, and so i'm hoping as people see us honor that commitment 
that it will hopefully engender more willingness in order to participate in the committees. Because I think the exhaustion is definitely a thing, but I do think one of the really significant pieces is if you don't see the value of the committee and you don't think that it's being valued by leadership or that the results aren't being, being brought forth as they were presented, it really is a limiter to people who participate in those teams. I do also think we need to change the names. Sorry for this, because it's actually kind of funny and I'm not sharing it because it's funny, but when we changed the repurposing committee to the school closure and repurposing committee, we went from two members last year to, Dorothy will have to nod her head in the back of the room, I think we're at like 23 or 28 members. So if this evaluation committee, and pardon this, it's a terrible phrase, was like the teacher termination and evaluation committee, we would have had lots <laughs> of third through eighth grade teachers. So there, um, and I say that as an exaggeration to make the point that somebody mentioned marketing the committees mm -hmm. better, we need to figure out how we can express to people the critical nature of these committees to encourage them to have a willingness to participate despite that exhaustion, despite it being one more thing, um, and despite the fact that perhaps you know, they've, they've heard that these haven't always been honored properly. Um, and as that culture shifts, they'll see that they're being honored properly as well. You would think they would want to because money's tied to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it was called the Teacher Compensation and Evaluation Committee, yeah, that might saying. be a more pleasant way to label it in a way that we would get people to participate. I have just a quick follow-up because um, it kind of goes back to something seven questions ago, but um, also is kind of tied to it because you mentioned I know we're in kind of that a, a bridge year here, so like normally this would have been already decided. Um, but um, and you mentioned coming back in the spring, starting or starting that work again in the spring for next school year. My request would be that like before the teachers start next school year, it's already come, it's already official. That being said, also kind of puts pressure on building out this committee before that group comes back in the spring to make sure that we include those teachers. Um, but just having that, I know there were a lot of variables with switching the um, assessment, but making sure that, you know, when the teachers start, they know from the get go, this is what's going into my evaluation. And that's typically practice. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm hoping to make sure that that's our standard moving forward. Uh, one thing I did want to point out is that teachers have the option to do an academic progress plan in lieu of using this data. So this data, while it's important and it gives a lot of good information, it may not be what a third through eighth grade ELA or math teacher chooses as their data in partnership with their qualified evaluator, their principal or assistant principal, uh, to develop a plan for them to have a growth and achievement measure that they think is relevant to what they're teaching. So there, that's a little bit of a pressure release, I think, as far as if I'm a teacher, I'm a third grade teacher and I'm seeing my data based on the DNA and I'm concerned, then I can do an academic progress plan. I could use the DNA data in a different way to come up with a growth and achievement measure that would be appropriate and that would have uh, maybe the outcome that would make more sense to me as an instructor. Is that a state board of education thing, a statute thing, or a district thing? It's a district thing. Okay. Yeah. And has that something that's been around in our district for some time? Yeah, yeah. It actually started, I think, student-based outcomes as a model. Uh, when I was in Tyson's position, it was kind of um, an up-and-coming way to do that work. We actually use it consistently with some teachers who do not have this kind of data, right? So teachers who teach self-contained special education classes, uh, teachers who are in special areas, some of them choose to do this sort of academic progress plan. Um, kindergarten through second grade teachers. Currently, we're transitioned to FastBridge, so that might change for that group of teachers, but they're uh, on academic progress plans for the most part. So it, it's, it felt new and different and difficult to understand a few years ago, but now I think that more time has passed where more teachers are using that model. It's less um, concerning as far as a, an option. I will say as a previous Creighton teacher who, when I got thrown into a K-1 combo class and nobody knew 
what that looked like. I got to um, work with my administrator to do an academic progress plan, and it was very collaborative and in depth looking at the data I had and, and how could we truly find a way to measure what my students were doing. So it is a good alternative when you don't fit the box. <laughs> And it is something that I think the last couple of years we've really tried to broadcast that this is open to any teacher who wants to use this tool. I just have a clarifying question. Um, so as we're in this student outcome focused governance, we are moving to um, Mr. Mann's evaluation being based on AS, AASA scores, right? And so that is now we are, out of sync with, with it used to be the teachers would be the same as superintendent. Um, it's probably fireworks. I'm sorry, they go off like every night. Yeah, here. I didn't know why we were celebrating Thanksgiving with fireworks, but it's yeah. been ever Thanksgiving, since then. Thanksgiving, but yeah. every night since yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's been. Right here. Lot Heather and I live like three blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, Miss McSheffrey. So, so that's that's something I just wanted to point out too that Mr. Mann will be um, evaluated on a sort of a different type of data than the teachers, which actually I think would um, uh, give some comfort to teachers perhaps, um, because I know the the state testing being evaluated on that has always been kind of uh, stress uh, stressful and add, added stress. Um, so. Just something to point out. <laughs> that could be an option for teachers as well if we chose to go that direction. I think the challenge with having the AASA data is that you have to wait for it to be published mid-June. Mm -hmm. uh, then Tyson has to work his magic with figuring out how it's going to be reflected in scores. There's a, by statute, there's an amount of time that teachers have to have to review their evaluation score and be able to have a due process if they have concerns mm -hmm. about it. So for, for a lot of different reasons, we choose to use the benchmarking system, uh, which teachers leave Friday, June, uh, May 22nd, and they will know what their evaluation score is because it's all. Right. So it's also important that these assessments, which we are optimistic, will be aligned to exactly the state Exactly right. And, state and as Tyson yes. mentioned, DNA is aligned to yep. the AASA as well. So hopefully we'll see that sort of crossover. Yep. Thank you. Uh, if you're interested, I know we're maybe running a little long in our presentation, but this is how we arrived at the cut scores for the growth measure. Um, you're going to see that there's a large range in the second tier of the that growth measure. That is part of the idea of the bridge from last year's data set to this year's data set. Um, I think some of the concerns that we had that were not supportive of this range was that how are you honoring those teachers who really are kind of at the higher end of that range and working with their students and their students are succeeding with growth at that level. How does that compare to a teacher who is at the other end of that spectrum? Those are great concerns and great questions. I think. Uh, one of the things that we talked about philosophically was really giving an opportunity for teachers to have a breather this year with the data, um, not add that additional stress of, you know, maybe having a lower score uh, than they would have anticipated if we had kept the exact path scores. So that was sort of the rationale behind that. Um, Tyson, I don't know if there's anything more. Um. No, just that what you're what you're seeing in the top boxes is um, DNA from last year. So basically, we looked at last year's um, data. It was our first full year of implementation with DNA, and we were able to basically um, average out the number of kids that made ten percent. So as you can see for ELA, that's that thirty nine percent and forty eight percent. So our idea was is if teachers made the district average, that's why that large gap is there. So if I'm a teacher and I make the district average, even though I may not have made that. 80 percent yet we're still they're still getting four out of the five points so as, as dr lauren said we're trying to bridge that that gap that's why that gap is so large between 39 and 80. which could look different next year oh, i really appreciate that distinction because i had the same thought but it makes a whole lot more sense how you just phrased mm -hmm. it of if they hit the district average you are proficient 
um, similarly to how we compare ourselves to state averages, is not our end goal, but we don't want to penalize. Um, I have a question. How would, how or would it um, affect operations if we table this to give it a little bit more time to see if you can get that group that we were concerned about um, some voice or input? Uh, I'm sure that we could work around that. I don't see anything statutorily that would prevent us from having you adopt it at your at your desired time and time. I'm just wondering because I'm I'm I, I do feel that we could have been a little bit more intentional about getting um, those voice groups and in one of our guardrails we just recently talked about getting that kind of input and I feel like not having third to eighth grade teacher voice and on something that they're going to be getting you know measured on um, seems a little off putting to me it's just something that I'm putting out there I'm not saying that it has to be done but I'm not sure how the rest of the board feels if or what. Um, how you guys feel about maybe tabling this and bringing it back and seeing if you can. I know the holidays are coming up, so it might be hard. Um, I, I don't know. I just think in respect of the committee right now um, and what they've come up with, I think that we just accept it for now, but make Perfect. sure that we really are, are aware of, of that for next time. I okay. agree, especially because we're already halfway through the year. And if this were... If I felt like this plan was over heavy on penalizing a lot more teachers, I would have a very different thing to say right now. But I think you've built in those safeguards acknowledging this is a bridge year. And we are, because it's a bridge year, we're addressing this late. And so at this point to delay it further is also not, it just doesn't feel good for teachers to be like, I don't even know how I'm being evaluated. Um, that being said, I'll reiterate what I said earlier, where when this work picks up in the spring to plan for next year, I think we all unanimously want to see more representation. Third through eighth grade teachers, if you're listening, please share your voice. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Um, do we have any more questions or comments? Okay. So with that, um, thank you very much. I appreciate all the information and all the work that you guys do. I will do the recommendation of move the governing board, approve the qualitative data portion of the standard evaluation system for teachers, SES, for third through eighth grade teachers. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. And yes, thank you to the committee. And I don't want the committee thinking that I said that not valuing their opinion and their times. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page of including those other voices or not. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. The message has been received, so thank you. Thank you for all your work. All right, and that brings us over to our next agenda item, which is the Kennedy um, update. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Mann. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, we're, we're excited. We um, It's not often that uh, we're excited to be chastised um, through reminder, but we had an excellent reminder last board meeting that has been a while since we've done a public update um, in relation to the Kennedy build. And so you'll notice this is part one. Um, in the intervening time period, we could not pull everything together that we would like to share. So there will be a part two, likely the second board meeting in January. Um, and you know we'll get that timeline to the board as we're able to determine you know what we can get together in, in that in that uh, intervening time. Um, but today we do have some significant updates on the campus work and uh, Dr. Dupin is gonna walk us through that with some special guests that we have um, from our partners. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Dupin. Thank you very much, Mr. Mann, President Carrillo Dahl, members of the governing board, um, Ms. Shapiro and I accompanied by um, Phil Weddle, who is here this evening, our architect from Weddle, one of our our architect from Weddell Gilmore and Tammy Carraway from FMG, who've been our partners in creating this whole project and <clears throat> really bringing the vision to life, will be providing some additional information as well. So we're going to go over in this first conversation um, some of the insights around school naming that we've gathered along the way, uh, our projected staffing timeline, color palette, floor plans, budget and expenditures, and the projected construction timeline. Because if you've driven past the corner of 28th Street and Osborne, um, like I have, you see that that building is moving forward at an incredible pace. And we are 
excited to open in August. And there's a lot of conversations to have between now and then in order to ensure a successful launch of the school. So around the school naming, um, <clears throat> the Larry C. Kennedy entity still exists. We currently have uh, students at Kennedy at Loma Linda who are, based on their address and their enrollment, enrolled students of Larry C. Kennedy School. So that school still exists. Um, staff are still attached to it. Um, some of the budgets are sorted and separated, and school accountability is sorted and separated and identified, attributed to Larry C. Kennedy School. So that, that entity still exists. Um, <clears throat> we have learned uh, through our committee work, through a lot of anecdotal conversations, people who feel strongly about the project, neighbors, others, um, that Larry C. Kennedy is a respected name in the community. <clears throat> There's Facebook like social media groups, there's YouTube channels, there's alumni groups. So there's a lot of attachment to that name. That said, we don't feel like we have enough, you know, we've really cast a broad enough net to be able to say, yes, we need to keep the name or we need to change it. So that's a piece of work that we feel like we need to engage in in the coming months in order to really be confident about what to truly call the school. Yeah, I just have a quick since we're talking about it. And for anybody that may not know who Larry C. Kennedy is, can you explain to us why that just briefly why that school was named? I'll be and happy why it's so important for the community. Happy to share what I know. Uh, Larry C. Kennedy was a uh, veteran. Um, he was the principal of the school for an extended period of time. Uh, rumor has it that or folklore, I guess, has it that he kept a cot in the, what was the book room at the school, so he could take a nap in the afternoon. Um, but I did have the privilege of, of interviewing when I was doing my doctorate. I got to interview one of Northern Arizona University's oldest living graduates. And she was a teacher at Larry C. Kennedy. And she, her name was Jerry Emmett, she's now deceased. But she knew him and she spoke of him as though he were um just revered he knew all the students personally he knew many in the uh, he knew all the staff personally their families he knew the community and it, so in, in addition to being a, a respected educator at that time he was a respected community member and family man and, and certainly his military service was highly regarded so those are the things I know about him. Um, there's not a lot. We've done some research and tried to pull information based on what might be available online and haven't been super successful finding lots of details. Um, Hilda, you have worked here a long time. Do you know? You were you actually worked at Larry C. Kennedy Larry School. C. Kennedy when did we change the name to Larry C. Kennedy? I am not sure. Okay. Because it was Lafayette. Lafayette, before. yeah. Nuts. We could find out what else we can find out and bring that in part two. And then do we know how long he worked at, at Lafayette? I think that information is going to be really good to know when we bring it back out to the community so we can make a real informed decision um, on the school. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. These kind of, if we can find out when we talk about the naming, bringing it out to the community and let and letting them know. Yeah, we, 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 you know, Dr. Tupin mentioned we've had community members come forward to share their concerns about the name of the school changing. One of those community members shared a story with us about, you know, some of the heroic actions he took during World War II. We have been unable to corroborate that information, so it's hard to know whether it's an apocryphal story or if it's, um, you know, an actual historical fact. So um, we can continue to do that and and reach out more deeply into the community to um, to try to get some more input and feedback. There's also been discussions around we've been moving away from sort of these full names of like when you look at you know Creighton School and sort of reimagining it as the Creighton Academy. So there's also a possibility if the Kennedy name is is something that we want to retain. It doesn't have to stay as Larry C. Kennedy. We could take Kennedy and integrate that into some other sort of naming structure. But to do all of that, um, we really want to get a sense from the community of what the feeling is. Just really quick, because um, you know I love the Googles. Um, so uh, <laughs> the only insight is obituary 
uh, provides is that um, he passed away in 1980. Uh, at age 64, he retired as a principal in 1978 after 30 years at Lafayette Elementary School in the Creighton School District. So I'm assuming part of that was as a teacher and part of that was as a principal. And he's originally from Missouri. Thank you. And I think you know, I, I don't have a horse in the race here, really. I just I just really appreciate wanting to find out more. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with I think shortening it to Kennedy, I've already run into this problem. You know, you go yeah, over. Kennedy. Yeah, it's always John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. Yeah, you know, yeah. so you know that's a problem too. But um, and I'm usually an optimistic person. I would say that most of the time. But there's always some risk in naming things after individuals because mm -hmm. a lot of times, sometimes they let you down. So. True story. A lot of That's why research is important. <laughs> That's something that the Lance is kind Armstrong. Of <laughs> Where's <laughs> Mr. Geyer in here? <laughs> okay. So we'll get some additional information as much as we can find about his longevity. Obviously, we have some now. Um, any biograph biographical information as well as distinguishing attributes of Larry C. Kennedy. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so moving forward, our projected staff selection timeline really aligns to all the work that has to be done as we think through you know, things like the ESSER sunset, um, the typical staff transition process when people want to move from one position to another. So we're actually underway right now with the principal selection process. We've opened up a posting. Uh, we allowed an internal um, window for in interested internal applicants to submit applications. And then that's immediately followed by a posting to the broad community. The most important priority on all staffing is to select a team of people who, in, including and especially the leader, who are deeply committed to developing this mission of environmental learning and, and um, I'm sorry, outdoor education and, and, and environmental sustainability. That there's a sense that there's a, you know, uh, not just a passion, but also a commitment to doing the work because it, it's physical, it requires a certain set of knowledge, uh, and we, are, we acknowledge that there is going to need to be growth into that, but we'd like to start a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, so that's all being sought through this process. Obviously, we'll keep the posting open until it's filled, but this is the timeline that we're looking for so that we can bring a recommendation to you, hopefully uh, early February. Do we have an idea on projected attendance given what we still have enrolled there and like what full staffing would look like for August? I mean, if I take that Please. one. So, so I th we had this conversation actually today in the executive team and it, it's really, it's, it's an awkward number to work with. So if you were to look at the number of um, K-5 Kennedy students that are currently at Kennedy at Loma Linda. And the reason I, I go with K-5 is there's a possibility we might choose to open that way because very often those uh, middle school kids kind of want to stay with their peers to, to graduate, you know, as they not graduate, but commence out of the system. So um, if we were to look at that number, it's about 187. But what we know, there's several things we know factually, we know that students disperse to other schools as well. So there's a fairly sizable contingent. I don't have the exact number that went to Monta Vista, because if you think about the placement of Kennedy, mm -hmm. it is equidistantly placed between Monta Vista and, um, and Lone Kennedy. At Lone Linda. <laughs> so um, the other thing that we've seen is we have seen some students, you know, show up at Papago and some of the other school sites. Um, but I think most importantly, it is my belief, and I don't have a way to prove it, that we have a sizable number of students that have left us for SAGE because um, it is literally right around the corner from Larry C. Kennedy. In the intervening time period, um, SAGE has changed their school colors to the old Kennedy school colors of blue and red. Come on. And they have changed their <laughs> and they have changed their mascot name to the dragons. Oh, come on. And so there has Copyright been Copyright infringement. What's clearly an active campaign. And this happened once before um, early on when I was here, I want to say around 2016, where there was an active campaign to convince families in the neighborhood that Sage was the local yeah. public school. And I've honestly been around for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Probably so, almost 30 years or so. Yeah. 
So I, I, it is my belief that when this beautiful new school opens, we'll be retrieving a fair number of those students from, from the business building down the street. Yes, from the business building down the street. Well, and then I live in the apartment complex across the street, and I'm already campaigning. I even campaigned the property management group already, and Crate and stuff is inside of the office already. So they're not going to take my kids there, <laughs> my kids away from there, because I'm already campaigning all the parents. <laughs> I have a follow up um, <clears throat> for Dr. Dupin on the staffing. One, I appreciate that you made a point because I was going to ask you if you didn't start with <laughs> that we need um, staff who are really buying into this vision. Um, my follow-up question is, how are we advertising that for the people who are choosing to apply? So they're not just walking into an interview like this isn't just a regular, you know, teaching position. Um, two, are we, I know districts tend to have kind of a set standard set of interview questions, but are we modifying those slightly? Um, because I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of similar to when we had the Creighton Academy, where we did need to add in some more specificity to make sure it was the right fit. Because I, I firmly believe that when you interview, you're seeing if the candidate is the right fit for you, but also the candidate is interviewing you as an employer to see if you're the right fit for them as well. So how are we making sure that that happens? Great questions, and thank you. I think we have we do have a committee. It's called the Kennedy team. And to your point, Ms. Ayers, I do think that the representation could use enhancement, um, but they are very um, committed, very interested. So one of the challenges that they've been tasked with is to come up with um, look for's that match the instructional vision for the school. So they're going to have significant input on the design of the rubrics for the and the in-basket activities for the principal, um, teachers, and support personnel, because we want everybody to really be to really understand and and be already partly bought into this this great vision. So that committee will do a large uh, body of that work in terms of advertising the position, we do have a typical system that we utilize, and I might defer to Dr. Lauren to describe that. We go through the Arizona Department of Education and post our positions there. We use LinkedIn. We use Indeed. Am I missing it? Uh, ASBA. Oh, a ASBA. ASA. ASA. Well, I mean, but like our, because I know, like, that's what we do for all teaching positions, and it's typically a standard uh, job description. Is there any way that we're kind of setting apart and saying this is the vision of this new school and we're looking for staff who fit really well with this? We that have some, so we've established some really good partnerships um, through the support of the board, um, through our work through professional development. So our, our intention is to leverage those partnerships to sort of say, who do you know, or how might we engage a broader community? So I'll use Dr. Zyker at ASU as an example. He's been a tremendous resource for our Growing Gardens program. So he would be somebody, he, he is, our intention is to tap into him and partners like him who have access to communities of practice that are, that are aligned but different in terms of their, their focus on outdoor education and environmental sustainability. I think along those same lines, too, I think this is a great opportunity um, going back to the change people or change people topic. If we're going to be <laughs> trying to, you know, staff a school, I know some of those people might be transfers, but there's going to be a considerable number of new employees. And I think it'd be in our best interest to test out or start to move in the way that we are kind of bringing up a lot of this stuff in the hiring process. And you might already do, but the stuff we're doing with student outcomes focused governance so that people know what train they're getting on um, before they get on and want to jump off. May I add to uh, what Dr. Dubin shared? Um, Emily Waslek and myself are working to come up with the marketing materials as we go out into the spring. We know that we'll be doing campus visits, NAU, GU, ASU, I know ASU has a really big sustainability program. So there are, I think, some of those opportunities for us to be in the mix with the college students that are matriculating into a career uh, to be able to kind of explore that. And I know that was a similar practice with TCA. In our brochure, there was a, a full page dedicated to this is what the Creighton Academy is and this is what it, how it's going to be different. So we're going to model that as well. 
I think that's what we're looking for. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't really seen that yet. Um, uh, and I think right. even like, you know, this, I guess it'll have to be, it'll be your job because we just don't have time to like, mm -hmm. but a portrait of who that leader might look like and a portrait of what types of students those kids would, would be like, you know, curious, you know, flexible, um, things like that would probably be helpful for recruitment of staff and also families. We did um, in the principal posting, there is a description that we used the TCA template for it, but we altered it to make it specific to the Kennedy experience. Uh, so hopefully Great. that'll help at least frame what we're looking for. Uh, and then we can adjust it for teachers and other staff members as well. Great. Thank you. Because I think, you know, Principal Cartier and the team at TCA, it's that's been one of the biggest strengths. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make sure we're kind of whatever, whatever about that worked. Let's do it again with this vision. <laughs> and and that, that's what, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that is what the, the team's working on. Um, I do think one of the recipes for that success, and it's one of the things that's the heaviest lift for Principal Cartier, but it's also one of the great blessings, is that sometimes when you have a school that's very different, people who are very set into the normal experience of school, that they may not be interested in kind of taking on that challenge. And so when you visit that campus, you'll notice it's a very young staff. And so that's, I think, why the team's looking at working with the NAUs and the ASUs, because we definitely would love to have some seasoned veterans that are willing to take on the work. But at the same time, it's likely that the majority of the staff will be folks coming out of those universities that are looking for this different type of experience as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I'll take this opportunity to shout out quickly Ms. Cartier, who is actually leading our Kennedy launch team because she knows what it's like to or open a school that's unlike anything else. Um, Mr. Geyer, who's here tonight, he's been a, a two-year contributor to the committee's work, and he built Creighton Virtual Academy from literally an idea and has brought a lot of insight to bear. Um, and then one of our teachers from the Creighton Academy, Riley Wilkie, who is doing an administrative internship has also been contributing. And I think she's in her, she's, this is her third year. Um, and, you know, they've just brought so much insight and so much value. And there are many, many others, but those are our three names to, to call out to, to giving input into this process. And then just to, to call out too, we will, in an ideal world, the principal would be in place and then we would follow up with the additional hiring. Um, of all of the other staff. So our timeline is 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 posted there for uh, posting. Obviously, we'll keep all postings up and continue all recruitment efforts until we are fully staffed. Um, the, what did I wanna say about that? Oh, if, <coughs> if we're not in a position to have fully identified and hired the leader that we want, or if say we find somebody, but they're not available till next contract year, um, we, between myself, Dr. Lauren, Ms. Shapiro, uh, Dr. Pombo, and the members of the committee, we're all fully vested in making sure that we're facilitating that hiring and selection process, ideally with the input of the, the principal that's coming on board, but we stand ready to, to implement even if that person hasn't yet been able to start. And one thing I do want to add, I um, I stepped away to the bathroom, but when it came to the marketing is that you have a lot of um, experienced community organizers sitting on your board too. So we're always ready to help. And if that means marketing to the doors, which is in my experience been the number one um, way of communicating people at their level, I'm for me, myself and I, I am always down to do that just because I've that's something I've always done. So um, I think that's one of the greatest things about a new rebuild and this relationship that we have with, you know, admin and the board too, that we can really work together and use us as leverage too, or some of us who have that um, community organizing experience on how to make sure we get this information to our neighbors so they can start knowing of where to send their kids to. I'm gonna skip this real quick because we're going to go on a field trip over to the table to look at some of the samples. <laughs> I was wondering. I'm like... <laughs> but before we do that, I just want to share, and I know these are probably a little bit hard to see. I'm sure we can get... Oh, do we have copies? Awesome. 
So I'll let those get distributed. We're going to take a little bit of a walk through the, the floor plans. So you can get a sense of what the interior spaces are like. I'll highlight a few key features. And then certainly if you have questions, we can delve into these uh, during uh, the second presentation as well. Thank you. Folded so I'm going to start with what's on the slide in the packet. It's the first page. So first floor. Um, one of the key features of this, and, and I apologize if some of this you already know, I just can't remember what we've discussed and what we haven't. Um, key feature and we think really the, the priority focus for the initial opening of the school and the endeavor into um, outdoor education is this central courtyard here. All of the live, all of the, I said living spaces, all of the learning spaces connect to or look out into the central courtyard. So we envision that being the very first place that we develop in terms of hands-on project-based learning in the outdoor environment right there and it's right in the heart of the school so the the buildings all the buildings will be facing the central courtyard is that what you're saying correct yes they all and like the doors open and there are windows out into the central court um that's a pretty neat concept and if you guys can't really envision that i believe tollison um unified high school district has one school i think it's west point that has exactly this concept and when i toured it when they first did it it was a really nice concept and also, they saw a decline in behavior issues just because it was very open in the space. They used that middle ground to do a lot of other things. So they saw a decline in their behaviors because it's just open and everybody's watching what everybody's doing. So I, I like this concept. And for any board member that would like to see it in person, I, I believe it's West Point, but I could be wrong. But they just recently did that like two or three years ago. Oh yeah, we were there together. Do we together? No. Oh, but yeah. One of the design principles that came up, I don't know if it was a design principle per se, but one of the running threads um, from the first concepts was that this school really needed to be, um, as all of our schools do, but with intentionality, this is a place of calm, a place of de-escalation. And I think when we started these conversations, we didn't even realize to what degree that was going to be essential in 2024. So this space has been designed to bring the outdoors in, to provide ample natural light, to elevate the perspectives of children and adults, all who enter, um, and really give them access to that feeling of connectedness with the environment beyond just the curriculum. We learned with the Creighton Academy that the building is the third, second, third teacher, third teacher. Sometimes it feels like it's the I don't know, <laughs> only teacher, no. Um, <laughs> it's just so important to maintain that idea that the, the building plays a key, key role in mm -hmm. the learning uh, and the support. The cues from Walgreens and playing classical music outside of the <laughs> There has not been a conversation about that yet, but we can take it to the committee. <laughs> oh, back on the first floor. So this right now is, as Jay mentioned, we're, a lot of the conversations have been around opening for K-5 so that kids can kind of grow into this space uh, and so that older learners can finish out eighth grade at the schools they're currently attending. So the ground floor is primarily focused around the K-2 uh, learning environment, on the learning experience rather. On the bottom left hand side of your screen, you see the three little yellow boxes. One of the opportunities that this, this new build provided us is to um, bring into play a purpose purpose built, purpose designed and built learning space for our PLACES program, which is currently at Vista. PLACES is a self-contained special, special education learning program for students with a variety of more severe and profound learning needs. And you know the space they're in has been retrofitted and made to serve. However, this space allows for much more ease of access, much more accessibility, greater accessibility and flexibility. It also allows for more dignity in terms of some of the personal care needs that the children have. Um, so this space also will have its own 
dedicated outdoor zone, so they'll be able to easily access uh, learning in the outdoors as well. Plus, they'll also have access to the rest of the campus, but they'll also have some spaces that are specifically for them. That's really exciting, and I'm mm -hmm. sure Miss Ragsdale and the other folks who do that work every day are going to be so happy to have these resources. She's she's helped us in the design of this and the selection of furniture and equipment uh, for that space. A lot of what's at Monta Vista will convey, but at the same time, we've done some really neat, cool, one-of-a-kind things just to make that space exactly what those kids need it to be. I love it. I also appreciate it because I was trying to ask her, I clearly need readers and I'm in denial. <laughs> so thank you, because I cannot for the life of me read that. I'm going by memory. I can't read it. <laughs> I have bifocals. I have right. bifocals. My contacts are for distance, and I'm just in denial. We can probably get some bigger ones to. <laughs> to you don't have to have the old bifocals anymore. No one has to know. No, yeah. I know my glasses. <laughs> my glasses are progressive, but my contacts are not. So the upper story is for the older learners at the point in time. There's also. Let's see. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Art and band and music spaces are located uh, in the upper story as well. So, oh. oh, okay, never mind. So with that, I'm going to invite everybody to take a little field trip and gather around the table over here. We do have some visual renderings that have been on display in the district office. But we've also got some material samples for the interior and exterior color palette. So if you join us over here. Bill, you mind locking it? Oh, I can. I can. I can get it. Go ahead. Are you good? I got this. Strong, independent, broken woman. <laughs> I figured everybody needed to stand up at this point in time. Um, so I'm going to start here. Phil's going to be my coach. So. These are the exterior features. So the bottom story is going to be this sandblasted sand uh, We've got a metal finish for the second story, which oxidizes in time, you know, probably after the first good months. So probably two to five years before you have a good monitoring. Yeah. Windows, clear glass. This is, for example, the solar Systems. Um, we have investigated that on other schools and found almost in the vast majority of cases it is extremely cost prohibitive. Um, if it's left to we need to make sure we speak up so that we're on the microphone. Do you think we have a, can we get a portable mic? Uh, yeah. Mine's more of our online. <coughs> Testing one. Given the statistics, I said it's cost prohibitive, and given the statistics, I mean, I know it's an unpopular thing, but statistics show that it's very unlikely. So. So then moving into the interior space, the um, finishes for the interior are, this is the carpet color primarily, that'll be throughout all of the learning labs with interspersed with pops of color. The theme was desert landscape Palo Verde. So if you envision like the Palo Verde tree here, the idea was to be able to bring that theme and that those tones into the learning spaces. The, most of the wall spaces will be the Swiss coffee. There will be accent walls in this color. I don't know what it's called, a lovely gray. And then <laughs> and then this is an accent wall. Oh, that's true. If only I could read it. You had readers. Just call them Palo Verde Bloom. 
Palo Verde bloom. Yeah, it's lovely. Uh, the trim around the carpets, and then moving in. These are the these are the ceiling tiles. So what's <laughs> One of the things that's going to be really different than the, at the Creighton Academy, Creighton Academy has the dark ceilings, the the exposed ceilings, and then of course the tiles are all going to be light in color. So it'll have that sense of, of openness above. Um, the restroom finishes are here. This material is what the walls of the stalls will be. Oh, got it. And are we going to have the same bathroom concept? Correct. As TCA? That's correct. Cool. Perfect. We've kind of created that as a as a standard as we make adjustments. And then this is the sport court, which is will be it's actually an open air sport court, but this is the finish that'll be on the That's no really, sorry indoor PE. <laughs> it's for an indoor half court PE area. Sorry. And then it will have the capacity when once once it's placed, we'll be able to to accent it. And this can go in the key. It can go around the edge. So there will be. It doesn't have to be dark gray like this. We have still have time to make the, the selection. Um, right, Phil? A little bit of time. It's and all in one piece, or is it in like sections? It's in sheets. Like it's, it's the same product that we used at the Creighton Academy. So if you've been in the Creighton Academy gym, um, it actually looks very similar to that wood look. Um, what's interesting is the gray is a nice match for it because if you look around the outer edge of the Creighton Academy gym, we had to put let's see, we had to put LVT, which is the vinyl tile, because we had those bleachers that needed to have a hard surface, and we did that in the gray, and that just looks really sharp together. I just wonder if I can get them out. <laughs> yeah, do you provide price quotes on this for right. personal use? Yeah. So tiles aren't going to start coming up as soon as she, kids yeah. aren't going to be tripping while they're playing sports. Is basically it. No, it's definitely it's for four years. I think is it four years, Scott, at the Creighton Academy, wherever Scott went. Yeah, it's highly durable. Cool. Um, hard surface luxury vinyl tile for some of it like the conversation stair we still have some decisions to make about the interplay of color in that space you know it's kind of like at the Creighton academy you have a like a like a place to lean against and then a seat so we'll have some choices there and this material so the wood slats uh, there are two locations we're looking at that at the learning stair we're actually using that on the side of that zone um, so that there's transparency between the circulation area and the learning stair and uh, we're also hoping to utilize that uh, in the ceiling over that learning stair as well it's a really great acoustic we put an acoustical backer on that and it's really great acoustic absorption to really make that space more functional acoustically and not look like you're Slapping exactly. acoustic tiles yes. up. It's, it's a very nice it's a balance. That, I mean, we've been striving to, to create a certain amount of naturalness and warmth materials, uh, both interior and exterior, and we feel that the, the natural wood really carries that theme forward. I kind of want to redo my house in these colors. So in the just the next agenda item is about the furniture package. And so you've had the opportunity to review all the furniture selections. In terms of the color palette of the furniture items, they are they are they've been selected to be in harmony with this palette here. So a, a bit of green, a bit of what's called blueberry, which I don't have a sample of here, but that's like for chairs. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> it's no, it's not dark like this. It's, it's, it's more, lighter. more like it's a little darker than this, but kind of. Yeah. Um. We did get from our from our from our committee. One of the pieces of feedback was that in Montessori schools, a lot of the furniture, most of the furniture is all maple. So that's cost prohibitive to use hardwood. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, we've intentionally selected some maple finishes to go on some of the uh, some of the furniture items without being without making it overdone. So um, hopefully we'll be able to bring some samples forward so you can see all that together. But for now, the intent is to create all of that uh, in harmony so that it reinforces outdoor in, calm, peaceful, and uh, alignment. I'm sorry if, if I missed it, but for the extra, did you share about 
how the steel will be steel initially and then be the patina. I said it would weather, but I didn't okay. explicitly say. I just, does I it start out gonna, like this? I just, That's correct. Yeah, my, my feeling is when you show up expecting that orange color and see this, you'll be like, what happened? Did we run out of money? We didn't put the orange <laughs> color on. Um, and this surface is, will naturally weather to that color, but it won't be day one. It'll, it'll take some uh, assistance from the weather to come. Fortunately, it's going to be going up uh, in the spring. Um, and so if we get some rain in our monsoon this year, hopefully by the time school starts, you'll start to get some of that weathering. So, so that's our progress so far. We'll let you go back to your seats and we're going to update you, I think, on budget and expenditures to date. Whoever gets paid more than all of us to do our job, which is also depressing. <laughs> Fun. I wish I went to school for that instead. Um, so, of course, as I was sitting here and taking a look at the budget and expenditures, I found an error. <laughs> so I just want to, for transparency, point that out. Um, that number there for the guaranteed maximum price proposal, Obviously, we have that set at the 22 million. The actual expenditure there is uh, 2.4 million, not 4.9. Uh, that was pulling from another cell on another uh, totals page. And I apologize, I did not catch that before we threw that into the presentation. So I have updated that and I'll send a new updated sheet out to the, we'll have ask Hilda to send that out to you guys. So you'll have that actual cost. Um, it's pretty, a basic summary just showing the areas where our uh, preset budgets were there under the project number. And then the actual is just our actual expenditures to date of what we've spent in those areas. And I just um, not sure, but if you have any questions on any of the details of anything that this uh, is presenting, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I know that this budget was set, uh, set I believe, May of 2022 or 2023? 2023. 2023. So I feel like you guys did a lot of uh, hard work on this and uh, put those numbers in place. I did make a note here under the total FF and ENT allowance that we are bringing an item tonight. So I, at, while that says zero, uh, our next item uh, will be changing that. <laughs> So I'm happy to answer any questions on budget and expenditures. Do we have any questions or comments? We'll tell you, it just looks about what I would expect. Just if, um, obviously services are what happens at the very beginning. So your services are gonna kind of uh, be more expended towards the beginning of the project because we have to get those um, architectural services, uh, um, CMAR uh, pre-construction services. Mm -hmm. And then also um, some of those fees and contingency uh, cost uh, that looked very reasonable to me. That's going to be your um, permits from the cities and the utilities uh, movements and, and pieces like that. So all of that has to happen before they start building. That's why those will be a little bit more expended than maybe the, uh, the GMP column. It looks about what I would expect with a new build. This might be in the part two but if, do we have any updates on some of the property pieces that we knew wouldn't be covered? Like yeah, I that wish, we're getting through donations and grants? Yeah, I wish we had more updates on that. The, the pieces that have been highly successful so far um, are those concrete donations that we had brought to you. Um, I know those are, those, you know, have been very helpful to the project. For the north end of the campus, Oh, I'm trying not to vent. Um, <laughs> so, so Scott, no, 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 no. It's it's all good. We, we have um, Mr. Wells and his team have done a job of trying to get us into as many grant opportunities as possible, and they've worked with our partners with the with the Creighton Community Foundation. Um, one of our community members who's connected to some grant opportunities as well. So we're chasing every opportunity that's out there. Um, one of the do it, Scott. Yeah. 
So one of those opportunities was through WIFA, and I have no idea what WIFA stands for, but I think the W is for water. And these were water conservation grants that came by way of the federal government passing money to the state government and then passing it to this WIFA group. Um, and so we followed, or, you know, Mr. Wells, um, with me watching on with great interest, followed sort of the guidelines. And what we envisioned for our submission was not just doing um, water use reduction on the site, but also doing education. Because maybe because we operate in the education space, it's our belief that if you short-sightedly just pull turf out and then you find some water savings from that, and then a generation later, new people come along and they go, man, I just got here from Michigan and I don't like all the sand. Then they come and they put turf back in. And the only way you break those generational cycles and create true stewardship for our environment um, is to create that education in our next generation, which would be our students. And we have found the best ambassadors to the adults in our community are our students, right? So, I mean, I remember um, at Excellencia, a student shared with us a recycling project they did, and then parents at a community council later shared with us how they can't get away with anything when it comes to recycling because those <laughs> kids hold them accountable. So the original project we put in, I think, was like a little over $3 million, Scott, and it included some of those instructional programs. What we found was the people that have been selected to the um, committee that's making the selection process has stuck very tightly to only approving projects that very specifically just reduce water utilization on the site. And so it became very evident to us um, after me spending four hours down there one afternoon, no, no, it's okay, it's not your fault, um, that we were unlikely to get approved if we left things as they were, which would leave us without any support from that particular grant. And so Mr. Wells, you, you have to appreciate him, decided to withdraw our original proposal, worked very closely with the liaison we were working with there, and has since submitted a replacement request, which is just focused on things like the, the areas where we're replacing turf with natural desert landscaping, uh, the rainwater harvesting, and some of the other elements. I'm probably forgetting some that are in there. And it was, was it 1.2? Almost $1.5 million. So we basically pared it down to the elements that help us provide what we want on that northern end of the campus, doesn't do everything, and some of the elements we want for the site that currently we're kind of pre-slugging but we're not able to fully realize. Um, and the challenge we have now is we're hopeful, seems very promising that that will get approved, but it's not a sure thing. And what they've told us is, you know, don't worry, you know, you'll know within the next six months um, <laughs> how that's going to pan out. So uh, my hope is that they understand kind of the ringer that they've put us through. And maybe we end up on a January or February agenda and we get this done sooner rather than later. But it may be a down to the wire type of thing to see that particular grant come through. In the meanwhile, there are, there's other work being done to support the community garden at the at the north end of the site. Um, there's work being done to secure some other grants throughout the site. And then there's been some adjustments that have been made. I don't know how finalized they are, but I know, you know, we've really struggled with the mixed feedback that we received um, in relation to the wetlands area. And I believe our architect team has come up with like a brilliant reimagining of that that still captures conceptually what we were trying to accomplish <coughs> while allaying the concerns that were out there and bringing the budget down significantly. So, um, and that's, um, and if I say this wrong, please correct me, Phil, but it's a rainwater harvesting garden is the concept that we're moving towards. Am I getting that correct? It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid, hybrid between the wetlands and the rainwater harvesting, yeah. So we've kind of scaled the project back in scope, which both addresses some of the concerns around the large body of water, and it also um, allows us to do it in a, in a more cost-effective way while still having a beautiful signature piece off of the media center and visible from 28th Street. So. Thank you. Um. We do have <laughs> Tammy Carraway here from FMG uh, to walk us through our construction timeline. 
And I just wanted to point something out on this. I'm, I'm just going to jump to the bottom. I know you want to share some information about the construction teams. Um, but just from the business side of the house, I am absolutely committed to bringing the budget and expense and some of this timeline information to the governing board on a monthly basis as we uh, you know, go forward and, and get to our final build. And uh, so I'm very comfortable to set that expectation for the board and you guys will be receiving it, at least this part of this presentation on a regular basis. It'll look very similar. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President and governing board members. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight because as you, if you've been by the site, you have seen a lot of activity, a lot of movement. And as Ms. Shapiro has, has pointed out on, on budget, those are two of the key things that FMG looks for. Uh, we're always monitoring budget and we're always monitoring time um, because time is just as valuable as, as money, especially when we talk about getting students and teachers in the building at the, at the beginning of the school year. We recognize that we have a goal of, uh, not a goal, we have a, a absolute must have this school ready for students to be on campus August 5th. So one of the things that uh, has been mentioned was the team and you've already uh, heard Phil with Weddell Gilmore speak. We also have Connor Lewis, with uh, Chase Building Team, um, and then of course myself representing Facility Management Group. But one of the key players in this is of course the district and everyone from Superintendent Mann to, to Scott, uh, Dr. Dupin, and I can't name everyone because I certainly will leave somebody out and I don't wanna do that. But your team from the district representation takes extra care and extra effort besides just their daily tasks. So it is truly a team effort to be able to accomplish what we are doing. Um, we meet as a, as a team, the team has single-minded goals. We've talked about time, we've talked about budget, but we also look at quality and how we're getting things done without, with minimal disruption to the community that's surrounding the school. That's, that's one of the very first things from hanging, walking and, and then sending up, uh, putting out door hangers so that uh, the community knows what's going on to making sure that um, the traffic is managed. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, you said door hangers have been put out? Yes, Where? before the project started, uh, the community was walked um, and door hangers were put out. Oh, to, not recently. No, You're saying no. Okay, okay, to, okay. To, to start I said, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to make sure that, that you know, we're, we're being community friendly, neighborhood friendly. Um, every week we meet for what's called an OAC meeting, and that's owner, architect, contractor. So I think you were talking earlier about using, uh, you know, different the alphabets. That's what our OAC meeting is. And this is a, a, a key meeting every week to discuss and foreshadow uh, things that are good that are, are forthcoming. Uh, you know, we, we look at what we need at a certain given time frame, so that we make sure that we get those things ordered so that they're here on time. Uh, and that's everything from mechanical equipment to um, uh, coordinating with um, SRP. Um, the other thing that is so important at these OAC meetings is open, transparent communication. Uh, I think we all, believe and recognize that without open communication, we can't accomplish what we're, we're trying to accomplish. The other thing I think, just as a reminder, this is a celebratory moment and we need to celebrate those historical um, moments that we have. You, you already had the, um, the groundbreaking September 27th and I'll, you'll see a photo of that in a, in a couple minutes, but you know, we go through these things so many times we've got a deadline, but we need to always pause, just as has been mentioned about, you know, restore and refresh yourself over how you need to pause and celebrate what is, what is happening right in front of you. Um, at these OAC meetings, owner architect contractor meetings, every week we also have a six to eight week look ahead in the construction schedule. The contractor has an overall construction schedule, but it's broken down into anywhere from six to eight weeks and sometimes 
depending, maybe even a three week look, look ahead, but we review key benchmarks. And that is what I'm always looking at is, are the benchmarks being met? Where are we relative to time on accomplishing those benchmarks? Um, and let's see, occupancy. You're gonna talk a little bit more about furniture, I believe, next. But one of the things that we coordinate with occupancy is making sure that your teachers have the time to get in for their professional development and start a school training. Your first uh, year teachers have that opportunity. You get your staff and your administration in because they're moving into a brand new building. So we look at that uh, in advance of the uh, July 12th target date to occupy. So, and as Ms. Shapiro has pointed out, we will continue to bring you monthly updates. So I mentioned benchmarks, and I look at benchmarks, and if you go to the job site trailer, you will see that they also are benchmarking. Uh, they've got these sticky notes, and they run through the entire project and all the different trades. Um, so the first benchmark, of course, the most significant one was the groundbreaking followed by grading. And actually when we had the groundbreaking, grading had already started to get a jump. So we've got a couple of photos there showing the grading. And then of course the balloon arch with everyone for the, the historical moment of, uh, of breaking ground. One of the next benchmarks at this point in time, and I'm not gonna cover everyone, I'm just gonna give you a couple snippet benchmarks that are right in front of us. Um, all the underground utilities have been installed. So that includes all the deep underground utilities, as well as some of the ones that are just coming up right under the slab, and then coordination with SRP of primary electrical service. Um, primary electrical service has been uh, installed, trenched, um, but we need to make sure that's one of those things that we anticipate and foreshadow because that has a long lead time from the design standpoint uh, by the utility company. <coughs> the next one, and hopefully you can see this. Uh, I know these. It, I know it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, I will help orient you. On the right hand side of this photo is would be Osborne, and immediately along that edge is the parking lot. So. Um, at that point, the parking lot had uh, the, the uh, gravel down, ABC down. Um, but in, then as you move to the left, which would be north, you're starting to see on the very top middle, the masonry being laid up for what we're calling, considering, well, sometimes we call it building A, it is building A, but it is also the southeast corner of building A. So the masonry is going up there. As you move forward on the right-hand side, you're seeing the slab poured for uh, the southwest corner of building A. <coughs> then moving just to the left or north of that, you see these uh, footings and stem walls coming out of the ground for um, the kitchen, air, kitchen and dining area, which we refer to as building or area C. And then the last one, which is um, really difficult to see, but it would be due east of that. That is the, the beginning of uh, area D. And you can relate those back to your, your floor plans. Um, another benchmark was getting the parking lot paved. Many contractors do this at the end. Um, but there's a lot of, of advantages to doing it at this point in time. Uh, one is dust control. It helps keep the dust down on the site so we don't have unhappy neighbors. Um, the other thing is they can just move things around easier. They don't have to, at the end of the project when they're, they're doing some exterior scaffolding and stuff, they're, they're not getting in the way of, of the parking lot and everything uh, being paved at a later date. Um, and then one of the really celebratory moments is when we start topping out the building. And building A, the southeast corner, is, uh, I believe, topped out now and will continue with a little more topping out and should be done by the end of this week. So in this photo, in the foreground on the right-hand side, sorry, uh, you'll see that slab. That's the kitchen uh, um, and dining area that I mentioned where the stem, stem walls were going up in the previous photo. And what looks like little square boxes, that's actually stocked block. So as of this week, that block has been dispersed throughout that slab so they can start laying the block up. Um, let's see. One of the things that I always get asked is, what do you do about delays? Because 
Um, a construction schedule is ever moving. It's ever live. From week to week, you will see adjustments in a construction schedule. Uh, and some of those happen because we have no control, even with early planning and anticipating what we need on site. Um, and when I say we, again, it's a team. It's, it's everybody's efforts to, to get this accomplished. But one of the things was we did not have a steel package arrive when anticipated. So what was done, uh, the masonry crews were shifted to other parts of the building so that the, the masonry continued. There is no wasted hour. So the masonry continued. They got a jump start in some of the other areas of the building. Um, and then they moved back over once the, the steel that was needed arrived. Future benchmarks, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go any further than, than this slide tonight, but future benchmarks will be topping out uh, areas or buildings B and C in January. The roof structure, which will be exciting mm -hmm. uh, in February, will start flying truss uh, uh, steel for the roof structures before long, and then hanging uh, drywall or gypsum wallboard, the interior wall material, uh, in building A in March. So uh, it's on track, on budget, on schedule. So. Any questions? Do we have any questions or comments? I know that y'all get paid and this is your job, but thanks to you and Connor and Phil for being here and sitting here for two hours to get to this agenda <laughs> yes. item. Thank you. It's our pleasure. It really is. <laughs> I, I, I don't take these types of uh, meetings lightly, so we are glad to be here to help uh, help you know what's going on. And, you know, when you were sharing the timeline, you talked about the the uh, groundbreaking and it reminded me of a grant I totally forgot to share with everyone but um, APS had stepped forward to help us with um, trees for the campus yes. but there were some, still some trees that we needed that we didn't have and um, when representative Longden attended our groundbreaking and she was asking questions about things we needed for the campus and um, she literally while we were there, called someone at SRP and said, APS is participating. I think you guys should too. And so <laughs> we we also now have a package from SRP to help make sure, you know, that, that um, we will have adequate trees for the campus. So um, the beauty of that is we will have those trees to help support the um, the existing mature trees that we were able to maintain. And so it'll be nice because we'll have a mix of new and mature trees. And then you know, I just realized, Scott, I think, was it on tonight's consent agenda, the shade structures for, for Kennedy? It'll be on the next one. Right, so. Nice. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But that's another one where some of the shade structures that we didn't have money for in the budget are being supplied to us via federal grants by way of City of Phoenix um, to the tune of a maximum of $75,000 per campus. And I, I really have to give kudos. When when Weddell Gilmore was hired and when Chase was hired, they, they, they experienced this with me. I always say congratulations and I'm sorry because you know they get to work with us, right? And we're, we we are probably one of the most challenging customers that they come across because you know we ask for a lot of things and we ask for a lot of extra support. And one of the things that they've done to really provide us with extra support is as we've, and with the team at Verigi in this case as well, what we've done is we've tried to interweave the tree grants, the shade grant, and the solar project to not only maximize the value that we get out of each of those, but to ensure that where they're placed on the campus, they're not interfering with each other mm -hmm. and that they're bringing maximum value for, for the space that they exist in. And so that created extra challenges for the Verigi team because we're like, well, no, we don't want the solar panel there and that's not the right shape. But of course it needs to be cost effective. And then it created um, challenges for Weddell Gilmore because they're like, well, but we were going to do this over here. And well, but if we do this other thing, you know, we can redesign this for you so you can have this beautiful patio with the solar canopy over it. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, it created challenges for Chase because all of a sudden we weren't ready to run conduits for solar. And then we had a solar package and now we're trying to integrate conduits for solar on an active construction campus. So um, we owe a lot of credit to 
to Scott and Tammy and and Phil and his team and and Ben and his team and um, the Chase team for really they spent a lot of extra. Who did I miss? Connor, thank you. Say the name, but I just yeah, well, then I need to make sure I get Shannon too. <laughs> um, but the po the point, and whoever I, you know, I always say this: whoever I didn't name is my favorite, so that's why you weren't named. But um, but I think it's really important to note because all of these people have put a ton of extra time into extra meetings that I don't think are normally part of a construction process to try to figure out how to all play nice together in the sandbox. And so they're simultaneously helping our project be as exceptional as it can be. And they're doing a great job of adult modeling that we don't always see throughout our society. So greatly appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? I just want to double down on the just gratitude mm -hmm. for all of the businesses, partners, firms, district personnel, um, people involved in the launch committee, the design committee, the community feedback. This has been, uh, you guys know, like when I was a teacher here, I was on the committee that agreed to, or put forth that we move forward with Kennedy as the next rebuild. And just watching this process has been amazing. I know it's been incredibly complicated and we can be difficult to work with, but we do it because we want the best for our kids and our community. And I'm just so appreciative that I, I am so excited to see this all become a reality. Like there's no words to express how excited I am. Yeah, we're just super thankful because you, it's evident that as this construction project has been going, that you really do take, and take into account what the board wants, the board vision and the community's input. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all. And I know I speak for everybody that is on the team and, and Verigi as well that we've been coordinating with. But uh, everybody I know is very thankful to have you all as clients. We're very happy. And I want to wish you all a happy holiday. And we'll, we'll see you all again in January. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That brings us to our next agenda item. Um, before I bring it forth, I don't know if there's any discussion. I went over the information when it got sent out. It kind of makes sense given the the presentation that we just had. So I don't know if there's any added on questions or discussion that we want before I put the motion forth. Okay. Seeing none, I move the governing board approve the purchase and installation of furniture for Larry C. Kennedy School through state contract to Arizona Furnishing in the amount of $848,327 with three cents. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. And that brings us to our next agenda item, which is future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? Um, Ms. Juarez, from the discussion that we had last time on changing our agenda, is this where I would put this as a next agenda item, or are we going to... Perfect. Okay. And then then I... is, just to confirm, the executive session will be on the meeting of the 9th, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Muchas gracias, everybody. Thank you. Um, everyone have a good night. I move the governing board adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you.